some that are with us in the audience today. I want to begin by recognizing Christy Shamblin. If you wouldn't mind standing, we'd love for everybody to see the mother-in-law uh, of Sergeant Nicole G. Lost at the Abbey Gate. Alicia Lopez, the mother of Corporal Hunter Lopez, killed in action at the Abbey Gate. Coral Brasino and Alan Doolittle, parents of Corporal Humberto Sanchez, also killed in action at the Abbey Gate. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for raising patriots, and I'm sorry for your loss. I'm now going to recognize myself for an opening statement. I'm not going to begin by belaboring any points. The President's withdrawal was a complete and utter catastrophe. The images of people hanging off of planes and desperate parents handing their babies over the airport walls to soldiers are seared into our country's collective conscience. Yesterday, every member of this committee in this room, Republican and Democrat, voted to require the State Department to come up with a plan for reimbursing the numerous outside groups who had to get involved to rescue Americans from Afghanistan. I can guarantee that private citizens flying 7,000 miles across the world to rescue Americans and those that worked alongside America for 20 years was not a product of the State Department's good planning and order. That was a product of chaos and a failure to plan. And we have witnesses here today that will be able to give specific pictures of what was happening on the ground that will be clearer and more accurate than any news report that I've seen. And frankly, I believe that's because the White House and its mouthpieces were lying to the American people as they were narrating what was taking place during the withdrawal of Afghanistan. I have no doubt that your eyewitness testimonies will demonstrate a clear failure to predict or plan for the worst case scenarios as we do when we plan military operations. I'm grateful to each of you for appearing here today. Command Sergeant Major Jake Smith specifically is here in his personal capacity. He is an active duty service member and so I would ask members of the committee to refrain from engaging him in political questions. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the failure to plan and the major repercussions that it had on diplomatic efforts and national security. This administration said time and time again that Afghanistan was not a war that could be won militarily. That's the administration's words. It could only be won diplomatically. If this could only be won diplomatically, then there is no other conclusion than the withdrawal was a complete and total loss because that is when we lost all diplomatic options. The literal failure to plan was completely, er completely erased the potential for on-the-ground diplomacy and created a black eye for the United States standing abroad and, and national security at home. I'm going to say this. I wrote black eye in my comments when I wrote this. This isn't a black eye. It, it, black eye does not come close to constituting what took place, what it, what it is for America with the draw, withdrawal of Afghanistan. I don't, I don't know the appropriate word to say what exactly that is, but it's black eye is not the right one. In the words of the administration's spokesperson, Jennifer Saki, the mouthpiece, the president asked for a review from his national security team. He asked them not to sugarcoat it, and he was provided with a clear-eyed assessment about the best path forward. These are the words of Jennifer Saki. She said that the president was the ultimate decision maker. He was the decision maker who chose September 11th as the initial drawdown date. He was the decision maker who pulled the people with the guns out before the people without the guns. The decision maker who collapsed the operations at H to, to H. Kaya Airport. It was President Joe Biden, the ultimate decision maker. He decided to, to make the decisions, and none of those decisions in that process of the withdrawal, they weren't made in the Doha agreement. That's not when they were made. They were made by the ultimate decision maker, Joe Biden. Americans asked after the withdrawal, how could the intelligence have gotten it so wrong? 
but I find it to be clearer each and every day that the intelligence didn't get it as wrong as Americans thought. It was the ultimate decision maker that was refusing to listen to the intelligence being given. Again, in the words of the White House spokesperson, Jennifer Psaki, the president believes there is not a military solution. This will require a diplomatic solution. She said that the president was clear from the beginning that we anticipated and planned to have a diplomatic presence on the ground moving forward. Why then did we see a repeat of Saigon with diplomatic personnel being evacuated off of the roof of an embassy, though that is exactly what President Biden said would never happen. It's because of a failure to plan for Murphy, a failure to plan for a situation when things don't go exactly perfect, exactly as you plan them. It's basic military. A failure to plan meant that the security of diplomatic personnel could not be guaranteed, and as a result, there's no diplomatic presence on the ground today. Again, in the words of the administration spokesperson, Jennifer Psaki, the United States will retain significant assets in the region, as the president talked about, over-the-horizon capabilities to counter the potential reemergence of the terrorist threat. That's garbage. Any over-the-horizon capabilities that we had to deal with terrorist threats were wiped out almost immediately, and it has only gotten worse. From the onset of the withdrawal and the decision to abandon Bagram Airfield, our capabilities were diminished and our security deteriorated. The Abbey Gate bomber was a member of ISIS-K who had just been released from the Bagram prison. Now, in the two years since, Afghanistan has essentially become a club med for terrorists. ISIS is using it as a training ground, though fighting with the Taliban. The Taliban is sending wel welfare payments to al-Qaeda fighters. There are no over-the-horizon capabilities to deal with that. It's the opposite. Our adversaries are literally gaining a foothold there. Just three months ago, leaders from Iran, Russia, China, they met in Uzbekistan to discuss what they called, quote, regional solutions rather than Western interference in Afghanistan. Our witnesses here today will be able to speak to the situation on the ground and that the failure to plan wiped out any possibility of what the administration said had to be the victory that was diplomatic efforts. As a direct result of, in my opinion, a failure to plan, not bad luck, bad planning, America mourns 13 of its sons and daughters. We have families sitting in our audience who mourn the loss of their sons and daughters. I've had numerous conversations with the families. And what I've extracted from those conversations is there's nothing that can bring back anybody's children. My colleague, we've lost friends. You all have lost friends. There's nothing that can bring back anybody that we've lost. We look for solace in how we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. That's, to be frank, that's what I've heard from the families. How do we make sure that something like this never happens again. So we're trying to learn so that we don't repeat those past mistakes. But from where I see it, those that made the mistakes are still in the exact same positions today. Or they've advanced in the positions that they hold. And they are now trying to rewrite history in order to tout the withdrawal of Afghanistan as a success. And what that tells me is that as of right now, they haven't learned a thing. I'm now going to recognize my colleague, Ranking Member Crow, the gentleman from Colorado, for any opening statement that you may have. Thank you, Chairman Mast. Uh, let me begin uh, by um, joining the chairman in recognizing the Gold Star families, Ms. Shamblin, Ms. Lopez, Ms. Racino, Mr. Doolittle. Um, our, our country owes you uh, a debt of gratitude that, uh, frankly, we will never be able to repay. Uh, your, your families have made the greatest sacrifice that any family uh, can make for this nation. Uh, and, and we owe you a debt of gratitude that even though we can't repay, we, we must attempt to do so uh, by conducting ourselves uh, in, in, a, in a way that is worthy 
of the sacrifice of your children. Uh, and that requires honesty, it requires candor, it requires uh, giving answers, and that's what I will endeavor to do with my colleagues here uh, in a nonpartisan way, because that, that's what you deserve. Um, also, I want to recognize Command Sergeant Major Smith uh, in the category of it's a very, very small world. I was uh, uh, Command Sergeant Major Smith's platoon leader uh, in the 2nd Ranger Battalion, uh, where uh, we uh, did multiple Afghanistan rotations uh, during that time. Uh, so, uh, Command Sergeant Major Smith, it's, it's really great to see you. All the way. Um, I, I do want to say, I mean, th this is an incredibly emotionally charged issue, as it should be, because the consequences were so high and so catastrophic for so many people. Um, it, but to do this right, and you know, I'm not, I'm not reading off of pre <laughs> prescripted uh, remarks here. I'm just kind of speaking from the heart, frankly. Um, to do this right, in my view, requires uh, honesty and, and, and candor, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and, you know, my critiques of the withdrawal, my criticisms of the withdrawal are, are lengthy and actually well documented. Uh, it was, I was very clear uh, in uh, 2021 that I did not think it went the way it should have been, uh, that there were a lot of missteps, there were a lot of problems, and we do owe it to uh, the fallen, we do owe it to America, we owe it to, to the taxpayers that they spent tens of billions of dollars. Uh, the over 3,000 people that gave their lives in Afghanistan, we to all of them to actually have an honest accounting of that. But uh, I also want to make it clear that my goal here is that the story of Afghanistan is not the story just of August of 2021. That's not the whole story, right? And that's not to, to pivot away from having an honest assessment of that month and that withdrawal because we have to have that uh, and the American people deserve that. But we have to broaden the aperture, right? This was a 20-year war. This was America's longest war, right? Multiple generations of Americans fought in this war uh, and, and sacrificed and, and gave for it. Uh, four presidencies were responsible for this war. Ten Congresses were responsible for this war. And frankly, honestly, before August of 2021, you ask most members of Congress to find Afghanistan on a map, and they couldn't, right? And there's an awful lot of Monday morning quarterbacking now, and people sitting back and saying uh, that they, they knew what should have happened, uh, this is what should have happened, and, and you know, having all sorts of opinions where, for years, nobody even paid attention to it, which I know frustrated us, right, to, to no end, uh, all, all my fellow veterans, uh, as, we, as we talked and worked on this and said this was moving in a, a bad direction for a long time. Uh, and, and nobody was listening and paying attention to it. So that's the history and the context. And I hope that we can have a, a hearing today that addresses elements of the withdrawal, that learns important lessons to make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past, but that we also provide context. That we also understand that there were, there's a long history here. And, and August 2021 just didn't happen on its own. That there are years uh, in a lot of th things that led us to that moment that are a part of this story here that we have to have an honest accounting of. So that's my goal, uh, and I look, I look forward to the conversation today. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Crow, and uh, I'm pleased to have the chairman of the full committee, Chairman McCall, with us, and I recognize you for as much time as you may consume for an opening statement. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that generous uh, recognition. I want to thank both of you for your service in the Afghanistan war. Um, Mr. Chairman, ranking member, um, I remember traveling as a member, spending days, and you were spending years. And we got a little snapshot of what was going on, but you were on the ground fighting. And uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, your loss of limbs, the sacrifice uh, that both of you made, but Mr. Chairman, particularly you, does not go unnoticed by this committee or me as the chairman of the full committee. And I just want to thank you for your service. And I want to thank the Gold Star families. It's good to see you again. We had a very nice visit last week. Um, you know, Christy Shamblin, the mother-in-law of Sergeant uh, Nicole G. Alicia Lopez, mother of Corporal Hunter Lopez. Um, I used, uh, by the way, Hunter's uh, pen 
to sign uh, my subpoena for the after action report from the State Department that is still yet to be complied with. And Alan Doolittle and Coral Brazino, the parents of Corporal Sanchez, uh, thank you and the witnesses for your moral courage to come here today to speak the truth about what happened. And to the ranking member, I agree there are many mistakes made in the 20 years, but the ultimate mistake ended 20 years of blood and treasure with now the Taliban in charge, raising their flag over our embassy, taking $7 billion of our weapons, leaving the women behind under Sharia law now where they can't even go outside. I was with the ambassador of Afghanistan, Roy Romani, had dinner with her last night, and we talked about what happened, what, how it was stabilized, and then it went into chaos because one man made the decision, and that is the commander-in-chief, and the buck stops here, as Harry Truman would say. So let's own it and take responsibility and not try to kick it down or go back in time and say it was someone else's fault. True leaders own mistakes. And this was a mistake of epic proportions. This unconditional withdrawal, I call it an unconditional surrender to the Taliban who now have taken over Afghanistan. And what's really sad, especially when we examine the Abbey Gate and we heard from Sergeant Tyler, Andrew Vargas, about the fact that it could have been prevented in many cases. That is the hardest thing I know for the families to accept. And I was there. Uh, we were there for the, the briefings from state, from DOD and the IC. And for months, President Biden ignored warnings from his own generals and his own intelligence community and bipartisan members of Congress about what was happening on the ground as the narrative didn't fit what was happening on the ground coming out of the White House as the chairman so eloquently went through, whether it was his spokespersons to him himself about what was happening. It was like a blind eye. The result of this committee's oversight so far, we did get access to the dissent cable from the employees at the embassy. They were telling the story about what was happening. They were the ones who said, Mr. President, it's gonna happen fast. They predict by September 1st. They got pretty close. And they said, we're not prepared. And you need to prepare for this. There's an old adage, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. This was a complete failure because we didn't have a plan of action. And what they said, was disturbing because it predicted exactly what was going to happen if we didn't act fast. And yet, even with that warning, President Biden and Secretary Blinken failed to change course to the very end. Rather than prioritizing U.S. national security and the safety of thousands of Americans, they forced this rapid withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan on an artificial timeline. I remember it was going to be September the 11th. What an insult to the victims of 9-11. That it was going to happen on 9-11. We all know they stopped fighting in the wintertime. Why, why wouldn't you plan it at a time that made sense? And then the shutdown of Bagram Air Base, our ISR crown jewels, to see Russia, China, and Iran, and the terrorists in the region was shut down in the dead of night. It was not driven by national security. It was driven by politics. You know, the idea that you're going to drop troop levels to 650 service members to do this is insane. And once we abandon Bagram, I'm sure we'll hear this from Jacob Smith, you know, 12,000 prisoners are released into Afghanistan. ISIS-K, the suicide bomber, released from Bagram. Seven billion dollars of equipment left behind, and now they're selling it to our adversaries and to terrorist nations. And yet we made zero, seems to me, very little attempts to get the men and women who fought alongside U.S. servicemen out of that country to safety. 
and our partners, our interpreters are now left behind to be hunted down by the Taliban with the very biometrics that we created. And now they can go door to door to get a fingerprint to confirm if they worked with the United States. And then they're executed. To me, it's sad that after 20 years of blood and treasure, where are we now with the women, the Taliban in control, the geopolitical issues that face, you know, China now is there, for God's sakes, and the lithium. China will probably get access to Bagram. It's hard for me to tell the veterans that, and the suicide rate is so high. And to them, I tell them it, it was worth it because you made this country safe for 20 years. I chaired the Homeland Security Committee. We stopped a lot of external operations to kill Americans. It's because men and women like these two and your sons and daughters were there getting that intelligence to make this country safe. So I want to, again, thank the families for being here. I can't imagine the grief that you have, but I can tell you that we are going to hold that. We're going to uncover what happened. We're going to uncover transparency and accountability is very important to me and I think to all members of this committee. And we want accountability. And I will not rest until we get that. And I promise you that while the president wants to sweep this under the rug, that I will never forget what happened. And I will hold people accountable. And we will, on this committee, ensure that something like this never, ever happens again. In the United States of America, the greatest country in the world. So I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Chairman McCall. A little bit of uh, procedure that we have to do here, gentlemen. First of all, I ask unanimous consent that the following members be allowed to sit on the dais and participate in today's hearing, uh, should they be able to attend. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Stefanik. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Elsie. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Crane. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Van Orden. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez. And the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Nunn. Without objection, so ordered. There's a lot of folks from the military that want to speak to you all, is what that says. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We are pleased to have with us a distinguished panel of witnesses. It's an important topic. We look forward to hearing answers to many questions. Colonel Seth Crumrick is a former Chief of Staff of Special Operations Command Central, and while serving in his capacity, he led strategic planning initiatives for CENTCOM and SOCCENT to defeat violent extremists. He was involved in the withdrawal planning for Afghanistan in 2021. He was previously deployed in Afghanistan during the initial invasion as part of Task Force Dagger. So from the literal beginning of the war in Afghanistan to the literal end. Colonel Christopher D. Kalenda is a West Point graduate, a combat leader, and a retired Army colonel. <clears throat> He's also the founder of Sabre Six Foundation, which he founded to honor the six paratroopers from his unit who were killed in action in Afghanistan. Bravo. Command Sergeant Major Jacob Smith has served for 14 combat tours in support of Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Freedom Sentinel, and his military decorations and awards include the Legion of Merit and the Purple Heart. He was also the senior enlisted leader responsible for shutting down the bases in Afghanistan during the withdrawal. Thank you for being here today. Your full statements will be made a part of the record. And I'll ask each of you to keep your spoken remarks to roughly five minutes to ensure all members have time for questions. I now recognize Colonel Crumrick for your opening statement. Good morning. I want to start by thanking Chairman McCall, Chairman Mast, Ranking Member Meeks, Ranking Member Crow, and the members of the committee and subcommittee. I also want to pass a special thanks to the members of the committee who served in Afghanistan, and a special thanks to the Gold Star family members that are here in attendance today. I appreciate your invitation to speak today. 
My goal or the goal of my testimony is to help the committee understand how the administration and the military's planning process functioned throughout Afghanistan's withdrawal and illuminate the points of failure that doomed the effort. We're all painfully aware of the terrible optics of our departure and the utter failure in Afghanistan. My hope is this testimony provides clarity, highlighting what worked, what failed, and how we can avoid making the same mistakes in the future. It's important to acknowledge our three strategic objectives and end states for the withdrawal. The first was to maintain an ongoing diplomatic presence. The second was to support Afghan security forces, people, and the government. And the third was prevent Afghanistan from once again becoming a safe haven for terrorism. We were not successful. I'll separate our planning efforts into two categories. First, strategic decision failures, and second, the planning process and its effect on mission execution. Four critical strategic decision failures set the conditions in the environment for the entire withdrawal. First, failure to follow the Doha Agreement. Fundamental to our Doha Agreement were seven conditions that the Taliban had to meet that would trigger our full withdrawal from Afghanistan. An agreement only works if both sides participate. The Taliban failed six of seven conditions. Example, one key provision was the reduction of violence by both sides. We greatly curtailed our air support to the Afghan forces, weakening their offensive capability, while the Taliban increased their attacks by up to 70%. Yet, we still began our withdrawal, giving no incentive for the Taliban to follow any of the Doha Agreement provisions. Therefore, both sides failed. The Taliban to follow the basics of the agreement, and we failed to enforce the agreement. The statement, we held up our end of the bargain, rings hollow and naive when our duplicitous partner never tried or intended to support the agreement. Second, selective intelligence blindness. Senior decision makers rely heavily on intelligence to make the right decision, both for what to do and when to do it. The trap decision makers fall into is selectively choosing intelligence to support their favorite course of action, rather than letting the intelligence and inform and shape their decisions. A five-month full retrograde operation with a transition of power to a questionable Afghan government only makes sense if you believe the Taliban will not threaten the outcome and the Afghan government is ready to lead. The administration made that determination based on intelligence that overestimated the Afghan government's capabilities and wished away the Taliban's capabilities. There was very little intel evidence to suggest that the Biden administration's plan would work and a mountain range of evidence to suggest the plan would fail. General Milley, General Miller, and General McKenzie all recommended not withdrawing until the Doha agreement conditions were met. These seasoned experts were ignored, and the best case scenario plan to withdraw immediately started the domino effect to catastrophe. Third, bad timing. The withdrawal window, May to September of 21, was planned during the peak of the well-known Afghan fighting season. The Taliban were at their strongest, most aggressive, and logistically capable during this time period. Why would we leave fragile Afghan governments vulnerable to the Taliban's strongest advantage? Why did the tactically meaningless 20-year anniversary of 9-11 drive the timeline? Ripping out U.S. military support with little to no warning at the height of the summer fighting season led to disastrous results. With the aggressive Taliban on the march, the U.N. reported Afghanistan suffered its highest civilian casualty count on record, not because of international military action, but because of Afghan-on-Afghan -Afghan violence. And number four, limited time for DOD and interagency to fully plan and execute the withdrawal mission and the subsequent and separate NEO mission. The military has a planning maxim. One third time to plan, two thirds time to rehearse before we execute the operation. There was no time for traditional military planning to include looking at worst case scenarios in real detail. To meet the 11th September timeline, we had to plan immediately and execute now. Prudence and patience were replaced by speed of action without the time to study the consequences and mitigate those risks. Shifting to the plan, the bottom line is the administration controlled how we withdrew and when we withdrew. 
making them the majority stakeholder of many guilty parties in the failure and collapse of Afghanistan in the current Taliban rule. How the plan was chosen. The new administ administration discussed options between February and April of 21 with the National Security Council. US Foray a and CENTCOM offered their best experience advice in the form of courses of action that provided the administration distinct options based on troop levels, timelines, conditions, and end states. The President's decision to ignore the best military advice and execute an immediate military withdrawal was a shock and a rude awakening for all the planners. There was a sense of dread and cynicism based on the timeline and the enemy threat. Given the strict guidance, CENTCOM executed a fast retrograde to provide the best force protection for our service members, reducing their exposure to any potential enemy action. It was impressive in scope and scale, achieving success by mid-July. But the unintended consequence of an unannounced and immediate departure of a trusted ally was the demoralizing impact it had on Afghan units at the height of the Taliban's fighting season. The brittle Afghan military collapsed. Many units quit. Those that stayed and fought found their reinforcements, resupply, and air support had abandoned them, damning them to be captured or executed by the Taliban. I highly recommend watching the documentary Retrograde, which captures this horror firsthand. The NEO, by mid-July and the successful withdrawal of our military, the Taliban tripled the number of districts they controlled, from 78 to over 200 of Afghanistan's 419 districts in just two months. They achieved irreversible momentum to take Kandahar and ultimately Kabul in the next month. While CENTCOM was hyper-focused on executing the withdrawal, the NSC-level tabletop exercises in D.C lacked the granular detail required to identify the Achilles heel of the NEO, the State Department's broken special immigrant visa process that would directly lead to the humanitarian crisis at the HKIA gates. Again, our military executed an unprecedented airlift of over 120,000 U.S. citizens and visa holders, largest in U.S. history. However, the Afghan allies who plan to stay and run the government could not secure a visa to leave the country and were trapped with their families at the chaotic H. Kaya walls. Pop-up ad hoc groups like Pineapple Express and the Afghan EVAC and Exfil network sprung up to help our Afghan friends when our government failed and abandoned our allies. I provide a first-hand account in my written testimony of Brigadier General Latif and his family's experience as an example. Looking at these decisions in total, it becomes clear our hasty actions set the conditions for the Afghan government's collapse, the Taliban's slingshot to power, and the loss of 20 years of hope and progress in the Afghan people. In conclusion, fighting a war and establishing a sovereign government means we have the moral responsibility to end the conflict and withdraw our military in a deliberate and responsible manner. We failed. The enemy rules Afghanistan. We owe our killed in action, wounded in action, Gold Star family members, combat veterans, their families, our allies, and the current bill payers, the men and women still trapped in Afghanistan under the heel of the Taliban, especially the women and the girls, a full accounting of our missteps and a commitment to never let this happen again. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Colonel Kermerk. I now recognize Colonel Kalenda for your opening statement. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the honor to be here. And I also want to recognize our Gold Star families and uh, devastated by your loss of what happened at the, uh, at the Abbey Gate. I know we're talking about a different date, but uh, July 27th, which is today, is a very uh, important day for me. 16 years ago today, uh, my unit was involved in the biggest firefight we had in the 450-day deployment in Afghanistan. Uh, hundreds of insurgent fighters uh, attempted to trap one of our units in a valley floor in uh, Nuristan province, eastern Nuristan province near the border of Pakistan. Staff Sergeant Ryan Fritchie, while reconnoitering a place to uh, employ his squad against the enemy, was shot and killed. Uh, he was awarded the Bronze Star for Valor and is buried outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, and in Hall, Indiana. A few minutes later, 
Captain Tom Bostic, uh, now Major Tom Bostic, was leading this company and his command post came under overwhelming attack. He directed the members of his command post to move to a different position where they could, could continue taking the fight to the enemy. Tom single-handedly counterattacked by fire uh, this large enemy force. Uh, he was killed by a rocket-propelled grenade. It's a boom I still hear. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his actions that day. Uh, we lost four more soldiers. Uh, Tom is buried at Arlington, gravesite 8755. He's originally from Llano, Texas. We lost four other soldiers in that 450-day deployment. Private First Class Chris Pfeiffer, buried in Spalding, Nebraska. Sergeant Adrian Hike, buried in Carroll, Iowa. Specialist Jacob Lowell, who's buried at the Abraham Lincoln National Cemetery outside of Chicago, Illinois and Captain Dave Boris, who was, uh, who was buried in Minersville, Pennsylvania. Watching the collapse of Afghanistan in August of 2021, and I had a number of emotions, just like everybody else here. I, I watched with sadness and horror at the attack on Abbey Gate that cost 13 of our service members' lives. I was angry. We've been at this for 20 years. We spent over $2 trillion, more than 2,300 service members killed, tens of thousands with wounds both seen and unseen. And it all came crashing down like a house of cards. I was disgusted. Disgusted knowing that Afghan military commanders were creating ghost soldiers so they could take their, the, the pay. Uh, they were selling their soldiers food, fuel, and ammunition on the black market as a part of the, uh, the kleptocracy that had become the Afghan government. And to see the fact that Afghan senior officials just seemed to take the money and run. And I was disappointed. Disappointed that another war ended in disaster. I mean, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. You know, one disaster is a horrible accident. Two disasters is a tragic coincidence. Three disasters in these large-scale interventions fighting insurgencies is a disturbing trend that suggests that we are not learning from experience. In fact, I wrote this book, Zero Sum Victory, What We're Getting Wrong About War. It looks at the three conflicts and the repeated errors, the chronic errors that we make in each one at the policy and strategy level that are increasing the risk that these wars turn into disasters. You know, in each case, our troops fight valiantly. They do exactly what they're told. They do it to a very high standard. But too often, the policy and strategy are not worthy of their sacrifice. And that's got to change. I agree that uh, we have an opportunity not to repeat the mistakes of the past. But if we don't address these policy and strategy errors that we continue making, then we are likely to have a fourth disaster in our next military, major military intervention. And that I find totally unacceptable. In my written testimony, I talk about uh, three of the immediate causes of the collapse in Afghanistan. I also address some of the systemic failures that are common to the three uh, recent wars that I mentioned and also some low-cost, high-payoff reforms that we can make today that reduce the risk of another disaster while increasing the probability that we're going to be successful in our next conflict. And I'll be delighted to take questions about those uh, in, during a Q&A. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Colonel. That, what you said very much stuck with me in my mind. Too often the policy and strategy are not worthy of their sacrifice. We need to make sure that it always is, always. And I think we're all united in that. 
And uh, I now recognize Command Sergeant Major Smith for your opening statement. Members of the committee, it's an honor to uh, be able to come here today and speak before you. And uh, to the Gold Star families, it's an honor to be in your presence. It truly is. My name is Command Sergeant, Sergeant Major Jake Smith. I use my rank and title only to identify myself and my position to speak on this matter. I testify before, before you, not as official representative of the United States Army, but as a citizen. I must preface my testimony by making it abundantly clear that I am not here to place blame on any organization or individual for the result of our nation's end days in Afghanistan. It is not my place as a soldier to do so. It is merely my duty to present this committee with the facts I know to be true so that you may make a well-informed decision. I want to make it known that I have little insight into the overarching strategic planning of the Afghanistan withdrawal. My area of expertise comes from the tactical planning and execution of the closure of Bagram Air Base uh, and the recommendations I made to members of the U.S. Embassy in Kabul regarding a non-combatant evacuation. I will stick to the facts and circumstances I personally witnessed and offer minimal of personal opinion. I very respectfully ask that any questions you ask of me keep to the facts of the matter and shy away from any personal beliefs or opinions I may hold. From October 11th, 2020 to 2 July, 2021, I served as the Area Support Group for Afghanistan or ASG Command Sergeant Major. The duties and responsibilities of ASG included all base life support functions for the remaining nine U.S. military installations in Afghanistan. These functions in included billeting, dining facilities, public works, sanitation, and emergency response. Of particular importance to my testimony is my understanding of the life support capabilities of Bagram and HKIA. In May 2021, I was given the additional duty to serve as the Bagram Senior Enlisted Advisor. This duty included the oversight of all force protection measures and entry control points on Bagram. Of particular importance to my testimony was my understanding of the security posture of Bagram and its capabilities. It was sometime in the spring that we received the first tentative date to work towards in finalizing our go to zero effort, September 11th, 2021. The order came to begin to close all the smaller bases, but two were left in question, Bagram and HKIA. For those two installations, there was a looming a question of whether or not they would close. Part of General Miller's guidance was to maintain order, discipline, and dignity as we collapsed. We would not just up and leave. We would hand over exceptionally orderly bases to the Afghan government. We were instructed to get as small as we could but still function on the chance that Bagram would be used in future efforts. This presented a significant issue to Bagram as we could not collapse to the point of inoperability. We would have to have the personnel vital to running power, security, and sanitation. If we began to close the base infrastructure too aggressively, we would not be able to function and maintain security on Bagram if it was to remain open. It was sometime in March or April that I first met with planners from the U.S. Embassy. Four planners came to Bagram to conduct a site survey to determine if Bagram was the appropriate spot to conduct a non-combatant evacuation. In this conversation, I was told that HKIA would be the other option. Prior to this meeting, I had reviewed the contingency plan for a NEO that had been created years prior. The contingency plan accounted for 45,000 to 50,000 persons that would need to be evacuated. It was members of the embassy team who informed me that the actual number would be anywhere from 120,000 to 140,000. I advised the embassy team against using HKIA for the following reasons. Bagram could house 35,000 people without overloading the infrastructure, whereas HKIA could only hold roughly 3,000. HKIA was a shared airfield. It was not completely controlled by the military. It had significant weak points in the security. Bagram had a completely secure airfield that would require a massive military offenses to overrun or breach. HKIA was surrounded by the city of Kabul and has 4.4 million residents. If there was to be a fight, it would be in an urban environment and exceptionally difficult to undertake and control. Bagram had a small town on the western edge and open terrain in the majority of the north, east, and west. Movement of any kind could be detected, controlled, or eliminated very early. The defendability of Bagram was exponentially that greater than that of HKIA. Bagram held the logistical capability to meet the requirements of 130,000 people. 
Bagram had over 35,000 bed spaces and could create more using cots within the air, uh, airfield hangars if necessary. Bagram had four dining facilities and food that could have fed those fleeing. Bagram had tens of thousands of gallons of potable water and on-site water for purification capabilities. HKIA did not. Bagram had a Roll 3 hospital, meaning that it had the greatest life-saving capability of any hospital remaining in Afghanistan. HKIA had a Roll 2 hospital, meaning that it had a deg degraded capability to that of Bagram. Finally, Bagram had four industrial size incinerators. It had two industrial size material shredders. It had the mechanical capability to destroy sensitive equipment on an industrial scale in a short amount of time. HKIA did not. When I laid out all my points to the site survey team, they verbally agreed with my assessment. I met twice more with the site survey team, once in May and once in June. In these meetings, I required about the offensive the Taliban had launched in May and the increasing ground they controlled. I asked if the NEO was going to be held in Bagram due to the Taliban's rapid advance that indicated an assault on Kabul. The team acknowledged the ground the Taliban had gained, but offered little insight as to the, to the decision-making process at the embassy. On or about June 14th, we were given the order to close Bagram by July 4th, well short of the originally planned date of September 11th. HKIA would remain open and provide a quick reaction force to the embassy located approximately four driving miles away. This was to be an enduring mission. All talks of conducting a NEO were ceased. It is my understanding that those in the embassy believed that the Taliban would not advance to take Kabul and a NEO was unnecessary. I exited as one of the final conventional forces in Bagram on 2 July 2021. My thoughts stayed with the forces that would stay on the ground as the Taliban controlled about 50% of Af Afghanistan on the day I departed. One single U.S. infantry company, Charlie Company 431 Infantry, 10th Mountain Division, led by Captain Swayze Brown and First Sergeant Andrew Kelly, protected H. Kaya for pro approximately six weeks before things began to unravel in mid-August. An area once protected by hundreds of soldiers and contractors was now protected by 113 American soldiers and two companies of our Turkish partner forces. Approximately 430 other U.S. service members in logistics, maintenance, air defense, and service roles also occupied H. Kaya. This was the only force left in Afghanistan. I will offer this final bit of opinion. The mission asked of this company and the subsequent Marines, soldiers, airmen, sailors, and coalition forces called to reinforce the small security contingent was monumental. The military executed this mission and the closure of Afghanistan with honor, integrity, and dignity. There is no force in the world that have executed such a chaotic and difficult mission better than our U.S. and coalition forces did under the direst of circumstances. They were asked to control absolute panic and anarchy, and they somehow did it. I thank every single one of them for our sacrifice to our great nation. Thank you for allowing me to speak here today. Thank you, Command Sergeant Major. We're now going to move to questions. I'm going to be be begin by recognizing Chairman of the full committee, Chairman McCall, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first uh, again uh, acknowledge the Gold Star families here, uh, and I want to thank the three witnesses for your moral uh, courage and clarity in your testimony here today. Um, you know, there's an old adage, if you uh, plan if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Benjamin Franklin, first chairman of this committee, Continental Congress, he was right. There was no plan. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. We have uncovered that there was a request that came from State Department to the Defense Department for an evacuation plan However, that came on August 17th, two days after the fall of Afghanistan, the fall of Kabul, four days after our embassy was evacuated. And yet the president says we were planned for all contingencies. 
I think Colonel Crummick, you uh, eloquently talked about how he recklessly disregarded his own National Security Council, his own generals, and the intelligence community that we were being briefed at the same time while we saw this rosy narrative by state and yet this dire warning by the rest, the DOD and the intelligence community. And the result was this complete debacle and failure. And so, uh, Colonel Crummick, my first question is, is to you. Was there a plan? Have, did you ever see an evacuation plan? Thank you for the question. Uh, Chairman, the way the process works for planning is we'll get an initial guidance that we need to come up with courses of action. So CENTCOM, US4A, built a number of courses of action that were very different. They, they were very unique in each, um, you know, characteristics of each one. It could be timeline, it could be conditions, troop levels. And then the senior military members. And Colonel, they, could you pull that microphone a little bit closer? Thank you. Thank you. So the senior commanders then will pick one and give them a recommendation and explain why that is. Now, feeding into this is also the intelligence community. So this is part operations, part intelligence, and they'll lay out, hey, this is the plan we think we should take. And in this case, General Milley, General Miller, General McKenzie, all recommended we should not do the withdrawal until conditions are met. Because violence had risen in Afghanistan and their concern was the timing was wrong. This isn't gonna give our, um, our allies a chance to be able to react accordingly to the Taliban offensive. So in the two minutes, I, I just want to drill this down because, sure. yeah, there was a recommendation mm -hmm. and you talk about the failure to meet the Doha agreement, but the president disregarded that, ignored that. He disregarded the advice of his, his DOD and, and IC and National Security Council. Was there ever an evacuation plan? Did you see, I know there's discussions. Did you ever see an evacuation plan? I did not. The discussions were going on at this high level. The problem was those that would need to actually plan and rehearse it were extremely busy. I think Sergeant Major captured it eloquently of how busy and how few service members we had on the ground. They were not in a position to be able to plan and rehearse. Now, we've issued several subpoenas. I have not seen an evacuation plan. If they had it, I think they would have produced it to this committee. And this led to the chaos. Who was in charge? You know, we heard Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrew testify that he had the suicide bomber in his sights, but they didn't know what the rules of engagement were, for God's sakes. I mean, there's no plan. There is, there are, you know, rules of engagement are confusing at best. They don't know what they are. Did you know what the rules of engagement were? I was not in the ground, so I can't speak to the specific rules of engagement. I know the military had a clear leadership position of who was in charge on the ground. What was lacking from my perspective was a Department of State leadership on the ground. So when I asked who was in charge, you, you know, if, if you have an evacuation plan, state takes over the evacuation, correct? Prior to that, the DOD is in charge, but nobody knows who's really in charge because there's no plan in place. And guess what? The Taliban uh, takes over. My last question. The rules of engagement are, are, you know, confusing at best. You have mentioned a defensive strike would be a rule of engagement. If you saw a description of the suicide bomber, along with your sniper team who confirmed this is the suicide bomber, would the rules of engagement provide that you could take out the threat as a defensive strike? If I saw the suicide bomber and I saw the threat, I would absolutely kill that suicide bomber. And yet when he contacts his commanding officer who we're going to interview, he says, I don't have that authority. And they ask, who does have that authority? He goes, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. And in the interim time, guess what? The bomb goes off, killing 13 servicemen and women, 160 Afghans, injuring 45 additional U.S. servicemen and women. Massive. Because one man says, you don't have permission to engage. We're going to follow up on that chain, but I think it all results because there's confusion on the ground. 
Nobody knows what the plan is, and nobody knows who is in charge. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, if I could just build on that. I think the point that you're making that there's nobody in charge is exactly right. Um, there's nobody functionally in charge of our wars on the ground in theater. So what happens, if I could just draw a quick, um, quick picture, is we deploy to combat zones in bureaucratic silos. So you've got the, you've got the president and the National Security Council beneath them, of course. And then you've got these different bureaucratic silos, so it could be uh, DOD, state, aid, uh, the IC with their different silos, and there's nobody in charge of this group on the ground. And had there been somebody in charge of this group on the ground, then what you would have seen is a plan that not only synchronized the military withdrawal, but also the evacuation. So until we get this problem fixed, we actually have somebody in charge on the ground of our wars, we're gonna to continue to have high risk of these kind of disasters. I agree, and by law, they're required to come up with a plan, and they did not, and that's uh, the point the chairman's made over and over, and I thank you for indulging me. Thank you, chairman. Thank you for your responses. Ranking Member Crow is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, uh, and thank you all for your, your testimony and opening. I just wanted to provide a little bit of context here, and I want to ask a few quick questions, starting with both uh, Colonel Kramrich and, and Colonel Kalinda. Uh, from 2016 to 2021, are you aware uh, that the Taliban had increased its control of territory every year for those consecutive five years? Colonel Kramrich? Yes. Colonel Kalinda? Yes, absolutely. Are you aware of any indications in that five-year period that the Taliban was in, internally involved in discussions that uh, indicated that they would be willing to uh, enter into a peace agreement with the uh, government of Afghanistan or that they believed that continued combat operations was the key to success? Either one of you. Their, petition, their participation in the Doha agreement would... Not, I'm not talking about the participation. I'm talking about intelligence indicating whether or not the Taliban really believed that, 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 that the path to success for them was a negotiated peace agreement or whether they were going to continue to press uh, combat operations. I, did, I don't have visibility on the specific intelligence that would lead to their thinking. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, I can provide some insight on that. Yeah, so, please. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2017 and 2018, I was in a in my personal capacity, I was outside of government at that point. I was involved in some track two discussions with the Taliban uh, leaders, their version of diplomats uh, who were in Doha. And, um, and then relay- You could be succinct here because I have a bunch of other questions. Yep. To, to, to just tell, answer the question yeah, if you can. When, when the United States removed the timeline, the Taliban, at least their diplomats, said, we want to start talks because we don't want our country, to use their words, to turn into another Syria. Okay, so who, who started uh, those talks and who, uh, what president agreed to the Doha agreement? Those talks started in 2018, I believe, under President Trump. Okay. And after that agreement was executed, did the Taliban largely stop attacking U.S soldiers on the ground in Afghanistan? Yes. And then um, uh, uh, after the Taliban stopped attacking soldiers on the ground in Afghanistan, U.S. soldiers, did, did that allow us to then reduce troop numbers? I'll, I'll answer that. So yeah. there were seven provisions. I'm one, not, one I, those, I just answer the question. After the Taliban st stopped offensive operations against U.S. military in Afghanistan, then did that allow us to reduce troop numbers? It did. Okay. And then uh, when did that uh, troop reduction start? The specific date? Rough. Roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. I know that we had started uh, reducing uh, troop numbers uh, after the Doha agreement, regardless the Taliban were not meeting the conditions required of them for us to be doing those withdrawals. And at a certain point, there was discussion 
Which we, are, we started in 2020, correct? Correct. R largely, re drastically reducing troop numbers in 2020. We did, okay. and we are moving. Are you, okay, uh, next question. Sure. Are you aware of a provision that me, Mr. Waltz, and Ms. Cheney passed in the 2020 NDAA cycle that would restrict the ability of the Trump administration to reduce troop levels be below 2,000 uh, unless certain conditions and certain planning and reports were made to Congress. Are you aware of that provision? I'm not, but I'm glad you did. Okay, well, this passed, it became law. Are you aware that President Trump uh, in early January, weeks before the transition of the presidency, actually waived that provision so that he could reduce numbers below 2,000? I know there was a discussion to bring the troops below 2,000, and I know General Milley and senior military commanders advised him not to do it, and they rescinded that order. So he did it, correct? He did, then it was rescinded. Now, would numbers drop below 2,000 due to a presidential waiver in January 2021, correct? Or, or if you're not aware, then just say you're not aware. I would, I would have. Okay. I would have well, uh, that is true. Um, if... If we had not withdrawn by the end of August of 2021, is it, uh, I wanna hear from each of you very briefly, is it your belief that the Taliban would have resumed combat operations against U.S. soldiers, U.S. troops on the ground? Colonel Kermrich. I believe, I believe if we had not pulled out by that date that they would have had a hard time once the winter started to be able to actually execute that, which would have given the Afghan government the time and space to get their feet you set don't, your to testimony, be able to fight back to the Your testimony the is that you believe the Taliban would not have resumed combat operations against the United States uh, in, in the fall of 2021. As long as there was negotiations going at the Taliban, we were, we were telegraphing what our timeline would be I believe that they would have respected it. It was the only thing they did out of the entire Doha agreement. Colonel Kalinda? I think if we did not talk with them and coordinate a new date, and it looked like we were uh, violating our end of the agreement, then I believe the Taliban would have resumed attacks. Sergeant Major Smith? Sir, respectfully, I don't have enough information, and I'm not in a position to uh, give my opinion on this matter. And And... Had they resumed attacks, which most of the intelligence shows they would have, would we have been able to adequately defend ourselves with the roughly 1,000 troops we had, or would we have had to have added troops on the ground? Would we have had to have surged into Afghanistan again? Colonel Kermrich. My recommendation would have been to add all the force protection required. So we would have had to have add, added troops? Right, I wouldn't call okay. it a surge. Colonel Kalinda. Uh, I, I agree, Mr. Ranking Member, that we would have most likely have had to add troops in order to uh, protect ourselves. Mayor Sergeant Mayor Smith. Sir, again, I do not have enough information to speak okay. educatedly. Uh, my, my point here is there was a really, really hard decision that had to be made uh, that, that uh, President Biden made, uh, choosing from extremely difficult alternatives that would have uh, potentially caused more conflict and more combat operations through 2021 into the present. Uh, thank you for the additional time. I yield back. Absolutely. Thank you, Ranking Member Crow. I do consider it a nonsensical question to ask about if something would resume that never ceased right up to the bombing of the Abbey Gate. But I now recognize uh, Ms. Stefanik for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Mast and Chairman McCall for the opportunity to waive on this hearing on this committee today. I want to start by thanking our witnesses for their service, sacrifice, and your testimony today. Command Sergeant Major Smith, I'm especially grateful that you took on this tremendous responsibility of testifying as I have the distinct honor of representing Fort Drum, home of the 10th Mountain Division, the most deployed division in the U.S. Army since 9-11. And I want to make sure in today's hearing that we remember to highlight that although Joe Biden and the Biden administration made reckless decisions that resulted in the avoidable, tragic deaths of our service members. 
uh, it is important to recognize so many men and women in uniform who served valiantly and bravely. In the spring of 2021, Command Sergeant Major Smith, you met with the U.S. Embassy Site Survey Team, and they told you they were considering Bagram and H. Kaya as two potential evacuation operation sites. Why did you advise the Site Survey Team against using H. Kaya, and were your concerns taken into consideration? Ma'am, I appreciate you letting me speak. Um, as far as uh, the, the site survey team uh, taking my advice into consideration, I, I don't know the private conversations they had uh, after they left. I, I cannot speak on that. Uh, from, from my standpoint, um, Bagram had a much more tactical advantage to conduct an EO out of. It was much easier to defend. Uh, it, the, uh, the entry control points were very much defended in depth um, it would have been very easy to, to create a filtering process within those entry control points to filter out those that needed to be evacuated and those who didn't. Um, it was just a much more tactically advantageous location. And meanwhile, the Taliban was rapidly advancing on Kabul, and every day it became clear that an evacuation would likely be necessary. And the recently released State Department After Action Review shows that the Biden administration understood that the closure of Bagram meant that the only place this evacuation would be conducted would be H. Kaya. And we know there were 113 soldiers from Charlie Company 431 of the 10th Mountain Division assigned to protect H. Kaya as the Taliban was rapidly approaching. From your extent of experience in Afghanistan, was a company-sized element adequate to perform the mission the 10th Mountain Soldiers were assigned? Ma'am, if I was in command, I would have had at least a battalion there. A battalion. That is a, a big difference from a company. Uh, this disastrous decision leading up to the Afghanistan withdrawal forced Charlie Company 431 into a mission that was nearly impossible to execute. And yet for over a month, the brave soldiers of the 10th Mountain Division defended H. Kaya as Afghanistan was engulfed in chaos. Uh, this hearing is important to bring transparency and shed light and ultimately answers to those families, particularly our gold-starred families, of whom I know some are here today. We can never thank them enough for their sacrifice. Thank you for your service, and I yield back the balance, Chairman Mast. Thank you, Ms. Stefanik. Chair now yields five minutes to Mr. Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the three of you to come on out here. Um, uh, Colonel Kumrich, um, I want to start with you. You know, we talked a lot about the Doha agreement. You were talking about how the, you know, the seven conditions, you know, six were not met. But I want to just kind of start by taking a step back. Uh, did you agree with the approach of, of starting those negotiations with the Taliban to start with? There was, a, it was, there was a lot of controversy about that. You know, should we be engaged in negotiations directly, unilaterally with the Taliban without the government of Afghanistan at the table? What were your thoughts about that? I think uh, the, it's clear that when you do 20 years of war, yeah. you have to find an end. It starts with open conversations, and it starts with having those open channels of communication with the Taliban. I think that that was an important step. I think it was something that needed to begin so that we could then expand it over time to bring in all the parties that were relevant to the situation. So you supported the idea of starting with the Taliban without the government of Afghanistan in there and then trying to see if you can bring in the other parties, is that yeah. correct? In my written statement, I, I was clear. I'm a realist. I know that this has to end at some point. Yeah. It's really when you control the how and the when, you have to be very methodical and deliberate about it. If that is an open avenue to begin the process, absolutely. Was it a good deal? Was the Doha agreement a good deal? On paper? Yeah. Sure, but the Doha agreement is worthless if you can't get both parties to do what is required. We operated in good faith to our detriment, and more importantly, the detriment of the Afghan people. Uh, when you were talking about the challenges in 2021, you were talking about how they were just tactically, if I remember correctly, you were saying that tactically, you know, trying to organize a withdrawal in the spring and the summer is just not a good tactical effort. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, would, would you then extend that to the timeline set out in the Doha Agreement? The Doha Agreement was uh, agreed to in February, 14 months later, if conditions were met, that there would be a withdrawal, so that would bring it to May 2021. Was, was that sort of a, a flaw then in, in the document to start with? No. I think if we got to May of 21 and the conditions were met, which is critical, then the stage would have been set did you, did you, for a responsible withdrawal. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you, you 
talked very deeply about your distrust of the, of the Taliban. Did you have a belief that, that those conditions actually could have been met, all seven conditions, realistically? We wouldn't get into this conversation if we didn't believe that there was a chance. The problem, and I think Colonel Kalenda hit it too, it's- So you thought realistically there was a chance that the Taliban would agree to all seven conditions? We wouldn't have put them out there if they hadn't. I mean, okay. you have to, I, you've got to take a, a leap of trust to say, look, we're gonna give you the opportunity to do it. The conditions-based portion- well, Even if you take a leap of trust, I mean, you know, have some sense of contingency and, and setting that kind of timetable up front of, of, of May I, look, I mean, you, you talked about how there, there haven't been these conditions met. You know, I agree with you. There were not the conditions right. met. And, you, and if, I agree, if I heard you correctly, you said we should not have started troop withdrawals and reductions unless the conditions were met. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to just make sure. That, so then the, the withdrawals that happened, you know, on October 7th, the reductions to less than 5,000, Trump saying we should try to have the troops home by Christmas. So you would disagree with those decisions as well? I think there was prudent steps taken when we saw the conditions weren't being met, when we began our troop withdrawals, and then we saw that there was no intention of the Taliban to actually follow these. At that point, you know, General Milley and other senior leaders talked to the president and they halted the withdrawal at that point to make sure that we were making sure that the conditions were driving the decisions. Yeah. Uh, Colonel uh, Kalenda, I want to bring you in on this. I mean, I, I hear, what I'm just trying to tease out here is, uh, is that and I think you kind of really hit the nail on the head. Just th th these were systemic problems across the board over 20 years, four administrations, two presidents of either party. I mean, we recognize there were problems and, and, and mistakes that were made uh, leading up to the withdrawal, but also you know, going backwards. Would you agree with that kind of statement there? In February 14th of 2018, the Taliban issued an open letter to the American people saying they wanted talks. And I agree with my, my colleague that we've got an obligation fighting a just war to uh, explore those opportunities. Now, you negotiate to secure your interests, not to give them away. And the Doha agreement seemed to trade make an agreement trading no U.S. troops for promises of no terrorism, and then there was no accountability. So there's no single person mm. who was able to, below the President of the United States, who was able to say, the Taliban are in material breach, we are stopping the withdrawal, and we are resuming um, you know, military operations against them. Nobody had that authority. And again, it's this, it's this silo problem. Yeah. And, and uh, a related problem is that... Um, the State Department does not have any body of expert knowledge on how to conduct wartime negotiations in which the United States is an active participant. This is a major shortfall in uh, the State Department's body of knowledge. It's a major shortfall in our national security thinking and one of the common sense reforms that, that we can make to prevent something like this from happening again. Great, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Kim. I find it an amazing leap to think that President Trump, Obama, or Bush are responsible for what happened in the literal withdrawal of Afghanistan, but everybody's entitled to their opinions. I now yield to Mr. Waltz for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, I think we, we hear this from the other side of the aisle uh, quite a lot. Well, we have to put this all into context, and there were a lot of mistakes made in the 20 years of war, and, and, and frankly, I think that's a sad deflection from the mistakes that were made the debacle that this withdrawal uh, was. I could fill this room with think tank reports and studies, some of which you authored, uh, Mr. Kalenda, and that I participated in in the Pentagon back under the Bush administration, which, by the way, talks began in the Bush administration. They continued in the Obama administration, all to, to varying degrees. Uh, and then we hear about, as we're hearing from the other side, about, well, it was really about Doha. And it, Heck, we even just saw that in President Biden's um, uh, after action review. But the end of the day, and this is the fact that people just can't get over, is President Trump's national security team went into him and said the Taliban are not living up to it, and he did not withdraw. They didn't live up to their end of the bargain, and therefore uh, we stopped. And then we hear, well, we, the administration, the Biden administration didn't have any choice. They had no problem with the 
getting back into the Paris Accord. They had no problem reversing course on Iran. They had no problem reversing course on the border. Heck, they even canceled an entire pipeline on day one. But yet we're supposed to be, you know, we're supposed to believe that they had no choice when it came uh, to Afghanistan. It's a bunch of crap. It's a garbage argument. And I think deep down, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle know it in, in their hearts. So let's, let's just stick to the fact at hand of this withdrawal and how it was handled. Colonel Crummer, you are a senior staff officer in, in Central Command, and you're testifying that President Biden ignored the military of advice of three four-star generals, General Miller, General McKenzie, and General Milley, correct? That is correct. And it's, probably, it's safe to, to articulate that our soldiers, their loved ones, were asked to do two conflicting missions, to completely get everything out as fast as possible in a full withdrawal, but yet also facilitate an evacuation. Is that accurate, correct? That is correct. Sergeant Major, you're testifying that your best military advice on using Bagram instead of H. Kaya was also ignored. Is that correct? That's not the way it happened, sir. It, it, we did not do it out of Bagram. And on Bagram, and this is critical to the family sitting behind you, was the prison holding 7,000 7, of the most hardened terrorists, including the suicide bomber that killed their loved ones at Abbey Gate, correct? That is correct. And are, were you aware of any contingency planning? The Afghans were guarding it, but they needed the base for power, for life support, for supplies. Were you aware of any contingency planning as the Taliban are closing in on Kabul to deal with those prisoners should that prison fall or should they be released? Were you aware of any contingency planning? Anyone? I was not, sir. And Colonel Crump, finally, I'll just ask you, were you aware of any contingency planning to deal with our SIVs, key Afghans like ministry officials, journalists, women, uh, activists, people that the Taliban would obviously had targeted for 20 years and would continue? Were you aware, or, including, heck, our own U.S. citizens, any contingency planning as part of this rapid withdrawal to get those folks out should our assumptions that the Afghan government could hold in the military uh, and the Afghan military would hold would fail. Any contingency planning along those lines? No, and it became very painfully obvious under extreme duress how big of a gap that that was. So this was an utter lack of planning that their loved ones paid the ultimate price for and that our Afghan allies right now today are being hunted down as we speak, are still paying the price for, and future American soldiers have to go up and to go back and clean up this mess, as we've had to do in Iraq, from the Obama administration decisions. I mean, there's a direct causality there, in your opinion. There and is. And, thank you. And what would happen to a leader in the military who ignored intelligence and failed to plan, in this case, till the day before, resulting in troops killed? What would happen? They would get court-martialed. How does it make you feel that not a single official has resigned, been relieved, been court-martialed, even laterally transferred? Heck, how does that make you feel? Terrible, and I would like one to take responsibility. You know, when JFK had the Bay of Pigs, he came out and said, the buck stops with me. You know, I am- Not only are they not taking responsibility, the President of the United States saying it's outstanding success, so it should at least Secretary Blinken, with the State Department in charge of this operation, in your opinion, at least resign? He's not going to be fired by the president. Should he at least resign? I can't speak of what he should do, but I would say that senior leaders definitely need to be held accountable in that organization. Well, they're not under this administration, uh, Colonel, but this committee will not let this go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence, both, uh, both, uh, both chairmen, and to, to our families. We will not let this go. As long as I sit in this seat, we will drive accountability for you and for your loved ones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Waltz. We now yield five minutes to Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the witnesses. And uh, I, too, honor the Gold Star families who are here and appreciate them sitting through and having to relive some of this. I would point out that uh, you've been mentioned about the 7,000 prisoners released. 
part of the Doha agreement was to release 5,000 of those prisoners. Isn't that right, uh, Colonel Krumich? I would have to go back and look at the numbers, but well, that was that was part of the Doha agreement. Yeah. If conditions were met uh -huh. and people were acting in good faith, that there would be steps taken. Now, uh, as I understand it, you were the chief of staff at uh, Special Operations uh, Command Central starting, what, back in 2019? I was. So while you were there, uh, why, you said over and over and over and over, we've heard this, there was no plan, no plan, no plan. Did you see any planning during the time you were there starting in 2019 leading up to Doha? Well, to be clear, US-4A had plans, like on the military side, and this is something I want to make sure is really clear. The military has military plans, and they executed them with, uh, under great duress, and they executed very well, both the acting of the withdrawal, which was key. I mean, they did that in an incredible timeline, and it's a testament to the planning and the execution, given the nature of the plan and the actual NEO itself, to get 120,000 people I out. I appreciate that. I know how well Rest. our military performed and how many people were removed, but uh, why then do you keep saying there's no plan, no plan, no plan? No, I don't think I said that. I well, said that, you I didn't said that there was a plan. when someone up here keeps saying it. No, the plan that we put forth as the military recommended course of action was not chosen. Oh, and a separate course of action was selected by the administration, which focused on the diplomatic footprint. Going back to my earlier testimony, there was three goals. The first was I, I having the diplomatic. I've got, a, I've got the testimony. I can read it. Uh, you know, talk about diplomatic uh, solutions. This is a, a committee that looks at foreign affairs, not at military. That's a, uh, that's a different committee. So I'd like to get back to some of the diplomacy. We've heard a lot about how the women and children left in Afghanistan or women and girls are being so mistreated. Isn't it true uh, that during the negotiations for the Doha plant, there were no women at the table, no women in the room? Would that have made a difference in some of the decisions that were made? Uh, doctor, could you comment on that? Dr. Kalinda? I wasn't in the room at Doha. I know on the certainly on the Taliban side, there are no women present. I think on the American side, uh, maybe th there were. Um, so that's all as I can... Part of the, how about as part of the Afghan government, as Mr. Kim was saying, that they weren't in the room either, were they? No, they were not in the room. Okay. All right. Well, another thing is reform that we... This, we've got to look at fixing this. We've got to look at how to make it better, not just keep going over and over and over again about how terrible it was. We acknowledge that. We, there were mistakes made. That our, our hearts go out to those families, but let's try to prevent it from happening again. Maybe one of the reforms that we could make and talk about is expanding that Afghan uh, adjustment, I think, or Afghan Agreement Act, where we look at the number of visas that are provided to get families out. Can we expand that? Would that make a difference? Would that be helpful? I was talking with uh, Congresswoman. I was speaking with one of my former interpreters uh, yesterday, who I helped uh, get a special immigrant visa. And his family is still in Afghanistan. His parents, uh, he's got siblings still in Afghanistan under threat. And it would be it would be wonderful if immediate family members yeah. of uh, our SIV holders could qualify as well. Well, let's do something, that, that something come from this other than just a rehashing. I think that's something that the committee uh, should look at. You also mentioned that in your written testimony, some of the solutions that we, systemic solutions, the problem with the silos, nobody on the ground. Would you just lay out for us some of those other solutions? So we can read it, but let's put it on the record. Uh, sure, Congresswoman. Uh, the, the first one I mentioned is we need a basic national security doctrine the military called a doctrine or set of terms and concepts. So we're using across agencies, we're using the same terms to mean the same things. Um, I was in the White House Situation Room listening to people use the word defeat, reconciliation, um, other terms. Uh, 
to mean completely different things, and that impeded communication undermined our ability to coordinate. Uh, the terms evacuation and withdrawal mean different things to different people. If we were speaking the same language within, the administ within any administration across agencies, then we would have a much greater chance of uh, improving communication and coordination, fewer things falling through the cracks. Uh, second, it, or related to that, is um, we, need to, we need to have a doctrine about war termination. The military doesn't have one. The State Department doesn't have one. The State Department's got no expert body of knowledge on how to conduct wartime negotiations in which the United States is the active participant, and it has not worked out well every single time. So that expert body of knowledge is not difficult to create and something that uh, you know, could, be, could be done fairly uh, rapidly. Uh, the, the next reform is to actually put somebody in charge on the ground of our wars. So instead of, right now, all the silos, deploying by silos, so the lowest ranking person that anybody on the ground reports to the senior leaders on the ground report to, the lowest ranking person they were all report to is the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't run a business that way. You certainly can't run a war that way. So we need a, a congressional equivalent of like a Goldwater-Nichols Act for the interagency, which gives the President the capability to appoint a senior civilian or military official to, um, to be in charge of our, of our all U.S. efforts on the ground and everybody reporting to, uh, you know, to, to that individual. And that person is then held accountable by the president for achieving U.S. aims and can also appear before Congress um, for proper oversight and accountability. Um, it would, we're missing that today in this, in this hearing. There's one, no one person Congress can point to and say, talk to us about this disastrous evacuation. Um, and then the, the final point is we need a much better doctrine for how we build uh, developing military institutions. Uh, the way we built the Afghan military was in our own image and likeness because that's what we knew. But there are other models for militaries and if we had a greater menu of options and you know, what sort of considerations would make one option more advantageous than another. We could have built an Afghan military that was much more self-reliant, much less uh, dependent upon us. And quite frankly, I mean, I'm a consultant. I work with clients. And I've got an ethical obligation to make sure that when we part ways, which we will always do, that my clients are better off and they're able to soar to new heights on their own. Um, what we did creating such a dependent military was um, was a malpractice. Thank, Thank you very Kevin. much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely, Ms. Titus. And I would think just personally that if the president doesn't delegate, delegate an authority, then he has the authority and the individuals report to the president directly should he not delegate somebody. Uh, in that, I now yield five minutes to Mr. Issa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'll just briefly say the first time I was in Afghanistan uh, was shortly after uh, we went in in 01, and uh, I observed that it was a shithole. I observed that it was never much of a country. I went to the so-called palace, and I was underwhelmed by the facility that the king had occupied. So it doesn't surprise me that, it, that 20 years later we still had problems. During that time, I saw rapid corruption, including Karzai, who he and his brother raped the country of, let well, me rephrase it, raped the American taxpayers of billions of dollars. We can talk for as long as, as anyone is allowed uh, about the failures of Afghanistan, but I do want to talk about the subject as you're here for a moment. Sergeant Major, you, uh, you laid out the difference in the facilities, one which was defendable, one which was uh, able to almost occupy a siege if necessary, but if I'm correct, would have required some flexibility in the number of personnel. In other words, if you have a mandate of less than 1,000 and they have to include the embassy, then you really don't have the flexibility to use uh, a Bagram. Is that correct? 
Sir Bagram, uh, that being such a large military installation, um, it had 84 guard towers, and that takes a significant amount of manpower to man. So given maybe double the amount, 2,000 or so, you could have defended that, that air base, and that's 2,000 not including the people operating aircraft and other things that might have been left there. But Bagram could have been uh, maintained and would have been safer had we had some flexibility from the Commander-in-Chief as to the number of, uh, uh, of personnel, correct? Sir, if you had 2,000 people, Bagram would be a much safer location. Okay. Uh, colonels, uh, I'll, I'll address you together for a moment. Uh, you both went to the war colleges. You, you both went Commander General Staff. Uh, so I'm going to go through a little quick history. I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, during Vietnam, the now 100-year-old Henry Kissinger negotiated what some would call a flawed agreement. You know, they, they had these peace agreements. But both during the, the time and afterwards, isn't it true that when Richard Nixon saw failures to comply, saw aggression, ta saw an attempt to take ground by his adversaries being the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, he bombed the shit out of them. Is that correct? Using a technical military term. Am, am, I, am I not remembering history that if, a, if, a, if you're non-compliant with it, that the commander in chief uses his or her authority to essentially let them know that there was a consequence for not obeying an agreement? That is my recollection. Okay, so knowing that the Commander-in-Chief had a history in what people often call that failed withdrawal of Saigon, which, by the way, was long after we had left and our military had left, uh, and, it, and it really was a post-period, uh, we certainly uh, could have a discussion about fa you know, failure to, to plan a neo-sufficient. I'd like to just go on to one other, uh, Benghazi. There are similarities with Benghazi, which seems to be there was no plan to withdraw, the military didn't uh, know who could do it, uh, and the like. And the facilities were insufficient. In the investigation of Benghazi, what did we find? We found that the facilities chosen, the facilities in which the ambassador was hunkered down, were not compliant with any State Department requirements. In fact, he died because uh, the fuel tank was right next to where he was supposed to be in a safe house. So, Sergeant Major, I'm going to come back to you. The actual loss of 160 human beings plus and 13 of our service members, uh, can it be reasonably attributed to the difference in facilities chosen between Bagram versus Hkaya? So the events that happened on Abbey Gate, um, I believe that if that would have uh, that would not have occurred in Bagram, um, the defense that uh, Bagram held, um, the ability to see uh, for you know hundreds of meters, um, and the uh, defense in depth of those uh, control points, um, I do not believe the result would have been the same. Okay. Uh I'm not going to defend the work of the Secretary of State uh, Pompeo uh, in the Doha Agreement, but I will ask uh, Colonel Cargram, uh, I think I'll start with you, uh, am I correct that there roughly were sort of nine months and nine months, nine months of the uh, Trump administration uh, followed by nine months of, nearly nine months of uh, the uh, uh, Biden administration, each of, each of them had nine months, more or less, uh, to make decisions on that, that plan. What would you say were the, uh, the fatal flaws during that first nine months? Did, uh, for example, the Trump administration withdraw troops to an artificially low level? Did they signal uh, in a way that would cause people to uh, 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 to evacuate in, in, you know, go through just quickly, were there actions during the Trump administration that you can say absolutely led to the events uh, that cost 13 members' lives uh, that you can, you can point to today? Not during the Trump administration. I, I don't see a direct causation uh, during that time period. 
And wasn't there during that next nine months plenty of times to make adjustments based on the actions of the Taliban during that next nine or so months? In my opinion, there was time to make adjustments. And were there any adjustments made that you know of during that period of time uh, that said to the Taliban that there would be consequences for their violations? No, and that was our failure in the Doha agreement. We did not hold them accountable to meeting those conditions, yet we continue to withdraw. Okay. Uh, lastly, the closing, the, the release at the time of that five to 7,000 uh, bad guys, if you will, was that related to the agreement or was that inherently related to the closing of Bagram? I specifically, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, w were they released essentially simultaneous with the closing of the air base? Sergeant Major, you were probably the closest to knowing the time schedule. Sir, I do not know the timeline. Okay, uh, we'll take that one to find out later. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Issa. At this point, we'll recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Crow. Uh, I thank you, our witnesses, for testifying today, and of course, uh, even more, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, I also recognize uh, the service members in the audience, veterans and service members, as well as Gold Star families. Uh, my heart is with you, our gratitude is with you, and it's something we can never repay. This 20-year war cost our country so much, and while the end was devastatingly heartbreaking, we could not continue to send Americans to fight a war no longer in our vital national interest. We owe a tremendous debt to the more than 2,400 U.S. service members killed and the more than 20,000 20, wounded during the 20-year conflict in Afghanistan. And we are here to understand what happened and, importantly, to learn how do we do better in the future. As my Democratic colleagues have said, August 2021 did not happen in a vacuum. This was a 20-year war. And to understand that what happened, we need to look at the broader context. Uh, Colonel Crumrich, you testified in response uh, to a question from my colleague, Mr. Kim, that prudent steps were taken in 2020 to start withdrawing troops, but later, when we saw that the conditions weren't being met by the Taliban, General Milley and others ceased the drawdown. But isn't it true in January of 2021, President Trump further drew down U.S. troops just days before uh, the change of administrations? I would have to go back and look. I don't know the specific answer to that question. I believe it is. I think maybe drew down to 2,500, literally within days uh, of what we would hope was a peaceful transfer of power. Uh, do you believe that President Trump knew that the Taliban was not meeting the Doha deal? Yes, which is why there was a halt on the withdrawal in late 2020. And yet a continued withdrawal in January, just days before he was to leave office. I would have to go back and look at those numbers. If you would provide those to the committee, that would be really helpful. And I think we need the record to be as clear as possible. For all of you, uh, what lessons should U.S. civilian and military leaders take from this war? Uh, Colonel Kalenda, at one, as you point out, what happened in Afghanistan is not unique. There was Iraq before that was Vietnam. I had two brothers who served during the Vietnam War in the Navy. My eldest brother, Bob, served two terms, uh, two tours of duty in Vietnam on destroyers and hospital ships. I remember as a little girl the devastation of that war and, of course, of the end of that war. How do we prevent another such disaster, Colonel? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. And uh, I'm not sure if Minersville, Pennsylvania is in your district, uh, but one of my troopers, Dave Boris, is buried there at, oh. the, uh, at the cemetery. Oh, um, my. Thank you for telling me that. Uh, I wrote this book, Zero Sum Victory, What We're Getting Wrong About War, to address the exact question that you, that you posed. I think there are a lot of different reforms that we need to make so we don't have a disaster like this occur again. I, I identified a few of those in my written testimony. Um, to include we need, the fact that we need to put somebody in charge on the ground, in charge of all U.S. forces. Uh, we need a 
uh, we need the State Department to have develop an expert body of knowledge for conducting wartime negotiations in which we're a participant. I found the, the whole process leading up to the Doha Agreement to be deeply troubling, uh, where instead of trying to focus on a deal and putting a total withdrawal of U.S. troops on the table immediately, um, as participants have told me it happened, uh, we should have, have instead work this a bit more like the Northern Ireland peace agreement, peace process, where it was a step-by-step -step process, testing the Taliban's bona fides and intentions to see if they would uphold their commitments. And, and then you gotta make sure that you got accountability and somebody on the ground who is able to make those determinations about accountability um, in, in the event the adversary doesn't, doesn't uphold their terms. Finally, we need something just as basic as a national security doctrine, a set of terms and concepts, so we're all, the same terms mean the same things to the same people. We don't have that right now. So DOD speaks one language, state speaks a different language, the intelligence community speaks a third language, and, um, and coordination, uh, good strategy, good policy falls to the cracks. I thank you, and I see my time has expired. Again, I thank you all for your service, and, and for those in the audience, thank you also. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Dean. At this point, we'll uh, recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, uh, Mr. Green, for five minutes. I thank you, Chairman, uh, for leading this critical oversight hearing, and I want to thank uh, Chairman Mast for his leadership, uh, continuing to hold the Biden administration's feet to the fire on one of the biggest strategic failures in American history. I also want to thank the Gold Star families that are here, uh, thank them for their unprecedented sacrifice to our country. I am confident that looking at my fellow veterans and leaders on this dais, we will finally get the record straight. I also want to thank our witnesses for their selfless service to our nation and the people of Afghanistan. We will continue to look to your bravery and your grace under pressure for inspiration in the decades to come. I find it tragic that the other side keeps going back to the previous administration when we know that during that administration the Taliban did not gain massive ground because they know he'd have bombed, the, bombed them into oblivion. When the circumstances changed massively on the ground and the military commander said exfil from Bagram, Biden told Milley no. It's that simple. And mistakes made throughout the 20 year 20 years of our time in Afghanistan do not justify stupidity in the end. They just don't. Any other wrong doesn't make a right. As I did during the full committee foreign affairs hearing in March, I want to say a word to my fellow Afghanistan veterans. Our service and our sacrifices were not in vain. Despite the strategic mistakes made in Washington, we kept America safe for a major, from a major terrorist attack for over 20 years. No one who served, and like myself lost friends, should ever allow these mistakes we are addressing today to detract in any way from those sacrifices. We protected America for 20 years. Please know accountability is coming. My own combat deployment in Afghanistan illustrated to me the importance of teamwork and dedication to the mission at hand, particularly when it comes to planning. In Afghanistan, we always had our fellow soldiers back, no matter what it took and no matter the personal costs. We took care of our own, including our Afghan brothers in arms, because our mission to keep Afghanistan free and America safe required it. In one of the darkest hours of American foreign policy, you all stood in the breach to save the lives of vulnerable American citizens and our Afghan allies from the vicious Taliban. You didn't let the mission down, even when the politicians did. You were left without proper direction or support from your commander in chief, but you didn't let that deter you. You all stood up and have continued to do so in a way that our State Department has been unable or unwilling to do so. For two weeks in August of 2021, we basically had no State Department in Afghanistan. Our active duty service members and our veterans did the essential security and humanitarian work on the ground, proving once again that America's greatest resource in any challenge is our men and women in arms. You all are a testament to the critical fact we have learned about the United States military and our veterans throughout the global war on terror 
that even when Washington fails you, you rise to every occasion. America thanks you for your dedication, courage, and hearts of service to your fellow man. Uh, Sergeant Major Smith, Command Sergeant Major Smith, you testified that after Bagram's closure, only one single infantry company, 113 U.S. soldiers, and two companies of partner forces was left in Afghanistan to protect HKIA. Can you give us the detail on how complicated this is, and do you feel there was, do you feel that number of troops was sufficient, and why not? Sir, uh, with the Turkish forces, I, I need to preface uh, with uh, their involvement in this. They manned one gate. Um, that, that was their area of responsibility. Uh, it was those, the remaining 113 from that company that was responsible for the rest of, of that airfield. That includes manning all the gates and ECPs. That includes manning all the towers and all the guard positions. It was an exceptionally hard task, and uh, um, there should have been more people there. We know that uh, General Milley asked for more and was turned down. Um, I have a question now for, uh, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Colonel, Colonel Cumrick, is that correct? Uh, can you explain why you were incredulous to hear senior officials express surprise at the swiftness of the Afghan government's collapse and the Taliban takeover? I think there's, there's two aspects to this. The first was the underestimation of the Taliban's capability. Over the last 20 years, we saw them in 2001, that initial Taliban force was not very proficient compared to what I saw, say, 10 years later, standing next to a bed in Walter Reed with a um, friend of mine uh, who was a team sergeant that got caught in a green on blue attack. And he described to me the 1,000 meter accurate firefights they were having with machine guns with the Taliban. The Taliban were getting much, much, much more lethal, and uh, it was only going to continue to rise. They were improving, and they were getting the logistics they needed, the training they needed. They were a real threat that was on the rise. Meanwhile, on the Afghan government side, and I think it was crystallized eloquently by, uh, by Colonel Kalenda, um, the Afghan government had a kleptocracy, had an issue all the way through that is preventing them from being able to achieve what they needed to achieve. So you had this very strong Taliban that was always going to be a threat. And to your point, they were stuck in those 78 districts that were frankly pushed way out to the hinterland. They weren't important areas. Um, but once we telegraphed that we were going to leave and the pressure was then put on the Afghan military, it was clear that that increasingly lethal Taliban were going to have a serious effect. We left immediately, absolutely spinning empty chair when our Afghan allies were looking around, where did we go, when the red storm was coming at them from the Taliban. And at that point, disaster followed. I apologize. I, ha I can't stay for the remainder of this committee hearing, and I'm over my time. I'm the chairman of the Committee on Homeland Security, and I'm going to a classified briefing on the 14,000 Chinese nationals who've poured across our southern border, many with ties to the PLA. Another tragic failure of this administration, so I must leave. But thank you for your service to this country. Thank you so much, Mr. Green, and thank you for your uh, support as well and helping to secure our borders. You know, I want to go back to a couple of things that's been said throughout this uh, by my colleagues on the left. You know, you have things where they say, well, there's no point in us rehashing this. You know, in the military, we call something that's being rehashed as an AAR, an after action review. And the whole point of conducting those after action reviews is to, one, ensure that these types of incidents don't occur again, but also to ensure that accountability is, head, is held and we can actually go forward and make sure that the right people are there. You also continue to hear, well, we need to look at it in its entirety over the last 20 plus years. You know, as someone who had served in the United States military, so as a combat veteran, like many of my uh, colleagues who are up here, when we take command and we basically go out on operations and those operations go wrong, we don't look at the previous command and go, well, the previous command had them for the last two years and it's their training that happened in the past that's the reason for these actual incidents and mistakes. But that's what they want to do to President Trump. They want to say that, 
Well, let's look at its entirety. Let's not talk about the Obama era. Let's not talk about the Bush era. Let's ignore August you know, 26th, which was under the Biden administration. Let's just focus on President Trump. And I wonder if that has anything to do with the upcoming elections and the fact that he's ahead in the polls. And we're playing politics, which is why we're sitting here right now over strategy and over actually holding those accountable for the actions that they're responsible for. You know, I wasn't an officer, but I was a non-commissioned officer, so I worked for a living. And the command sergeant major understands that all too well. The one thing that we know is that when we deploy out, whoever doesn't come home with us is on us. We don't shuttle that responsibility and that blame on anyone. That's exactly what everyone wants to do. I want to also just comment on something real quick. On August 31st of 2021, President Biden claimed that the Afghan withdrawal, and to quote him, was an extraordinary success. You know, I want to play a video, if I may, and then I want to ask that exact same question, if you can please direct your attention. Now, that was an American who was waving her passport at the gate that the Biden administration, that the Department of State Secretary Blinken and that Secretary Austin claims was manned full time and enablement of trying to help guarantee Americans free access. And to quote Biden, he actually said, all you have to do is show your blue passport and we'll let you in. He also tried to say that there was no chaos in regards to the withdrawal. Did that look structured as loved ones go through and look through body after body to try and find their deceased loved one who had passed? Did that look like proper force protection like we would have found at Bagram Air Base? that would have guaranteed the necessary standoff, the HESCO barriers that was going to be provided, the ability to house the SIVs and P1 and P2 so we could do proper medical and biometrics before just throwing people on an aircraft that they call the greatest successful operational airlift in history, even though it's reported that almost 70 percent weren't even properly vetted. Do we call that an extraordinary success, Colonel? That video is what failure looks like. That is failure, absolutely. You're exactly right. Commissioner Our Major, what would you say on that? Sir, under the conditions that the United States military found themselves under, I believe that in that chaos and anarchy, the military had a successful mission. The conditions were less than ideal, though. But to, to, to your exact point, and you're right, the issue and I say this, and I spent you know, over seven years of my life in Iraq, over three years in Afghanistan, Kosovo, Pakistan, northern Somalia. Was hit with roadside IEDs in 2006 in Baghdad twice, once with an EFP, which we're all familiar with. Those aren't failures by the U.S. military and those who are wearing the uniform. It's the suits, not the boots, who are actually responsible for these types of failures and these collapses. One of the reasons I ran for Congress is I got tired of people who sit here trying to make decisions that impact us as war fighters on the ground, but yet they have no accountability, no understanding, and no actual on-ground experience themselves. You know, less than 17% of Congress is actually made up of veterans prior to this last election. Probably the reason why, to your point, Colonel uh, Kalaitis, that we have continue to have strategic military failures time and time again. This incident that occurred during the botched Afghan withdrawal of the Biden administration was because they applied political optics over military strategy. But they're also responsible for that intelligence blindness that you talk about. There was credible intel that we know was provided day after day. And I've looked at that in our SCIF, in the classified briefings, and shown the day-to-day -day where it was giving an update on what was going to occur, what was happening, where the planning was, planning's finished, execution getting ready to happen, and then August 26 happens. And that's why we have 13 
of our fallen heroes and 13 new Gold Star families. And I'm here right now and proud and hold this in my pocket so I know I'm not here alone. When I've got our young Corporal Sanchez, his coin right here with me that was given by his family, who I know is looking for the same accountability because his death was preventable. But so was the Americans in that video I just showed. You know, we report our 13 heroes, but the thing that hasn't been reported was all the Americans who were on the other side of that gate waiting to get in, whose families still don't have a clue where they're at. The reason I know that there's more Americans there is because whenever I heard about what was going on in Afghanistan, Congressman Ronnie Jackson called me and told me about a mother and three children that were trapped in Afghanistan that are his Amarillo, Texas, born and raised natives. And he, tr he tried to reach out to the State Department to get support. And they told him, well, we'll call and see where they're at. You know, he's, a, he's a rear admiral as well. And when he called the DOD, they told him they couldn't do anything. They were in the midst of a withdrawal. So I put a team together of former squadron members, and I had the great support of a friend of mine, Glenn Devitt, from the Sentinel Foundation, who we put a team together and flew over there and actually conducted the first successful overland rescue. Why was it overland? Because the Biden administration thwarted our efforts on three different occasions to rescue Americans, even though we had an aircraft that was scheduled to pick up 28 Americans and fly them out. You know, it's interesting to me when I talk about the Americans on the other side where they're not admitting to them because one was a woman that we were in contact with with her two-year-old son and her father, who were Americans, who we were in contact with and told to meet at Abbey Gate, who had rehearsed our entire our policy and what we were going to do in our operational, uh, I guess our OpCon white paper, if you will. And when we found out that we weren't going to be able to come in there and we had to reroute, we asked everyone to leave, but she still texted and told us she thought that she can still get in. That was August 26th. And when we tried to reach out to her again, we never heard from her again. So very likely, another American and her son who's dead. You know, you also talked, and Colonel, I want to just clarify this for the record. When we talked about this metric-based withdrawal, the Doha Agreement, it was very clear that if the metric was not met, the agreement was not met, that we were not obligated to remove everyone. Is that correct? That's my understanding. And it also, prior to President Trump leaving office, when he was advised by his generals that we should not go to a zero-sum game of just pulling out everyone and we need to leave advisors behind so that our Afghan partners can be ready to repel, because as we've pointed out, they started getting better, then he actually changed the decision to leave military in-country to ensure that it happens, correct? That is correct. So it sounds to me like President Trump listened to the generals, listened to his advisors, had an actual withdrawal plan that was based on a conditions-based agreement, but yet the Biden administration continues to say that all these failures is a result of the Trump administration. You know, they didn't have any problem removing things like the Remain in Mexico agreement. They didn't have any problem removing other Trump policies, but this one thing, they were just absolutely hamstrung. Now, as all of you have led many men, have you ever been, when you take command, held to say that I can't do what I'm supposed to do to make changes for my command? When I'm in command, I'm in command. Colonel Colitis? Kalenda. Uh, Sorry? Uh, Mr. Mills. Uh, well, of, of course, when you're in command, you're in command. You've got constraints and limitations on you all the time uh, that you deal with, but you know, the buck stops with, uh, with you. And that's Man. why it's unfortunate that we don't have anybody in charge of our wars on the ground, because the buck doesn't, there, there's nobody to hold accountable. So you've got the three of us here instead of the senior official who should have been uh, on the ground uh, in charge of this uh, evacuation and withdrawal. You're exactly right. Commissioner our Major? Sir, I was taught from uh, a very young age as an NCO that you are responsible for everything your soldiers do or fail to do. Gentlemen, I could not agree more with the testimonies that I've heard so far today. And I just want to ask a quick Spitfire question, if I may, and, and, and this is to you, Colonel Crumrick. 
If we held on to Bagram, could we have better protected from the country from the Taliban takeover? Bagram would have been my personal choice, and I think it would have given us a better opportunity. Would you agree that if we held Bagram, that we could have also have had two simultaneous runways running to help with our near and our evacuation as opposed to taking over just HKI and giving up Bagram? Well, I also would build on that and say it's really about the plan. When you decide to make your plan all about the embassy and all about HKIA, you've limited yourself and you've taken away any last ability to be able to enforce the Doha agreement and you threaten everything that we tried to build and all the hope that we put in that country was going to get washed away based on that decision. I completely agree with you. And I would also note that the Biden administration not only tries to put on the Trump with regards to the actual withdrawal, but when the U.S. government takes over HKIA, which is a commercial airway, then all the people who are told November 11th is this magical date that we're going to go on, who had booked their flights on August 26th, who had booked their flights on August 30th, who had booked their flights on September 1st, through Emirates, through Cam Air, through Ariana, through the other providers, the minute the U.S. government takes control over that airport, all those commercial flights got canceled, which is single-handedly responsible for the entrapment of the Americans that were actually left behind. And my last question, which I just have because all of you, especially you, Colonel, who was in charge of SOCOM, other nations, including the UK Special Forces, was actually out there rescuing their citizens to ensure that they got out, yet the US never did. Why was US soft not allowed to rescue Americans? This is an unclassified setting. I know that US soft was highly engaged and highly active. My personal opinion is the scope of what was being asked was so vast and the time that was allowed for that to happen made it an impossibility for us to be able to thoroughly be able to execute exactly what you're talking about. Thank you so much. Again, it goes back to the original point, which is that not only were these 13 heroes, their death preventable with proper planning, with proper military strategy, with ensuring that if the metric and conditions-based agreement was not adhered to, that we weren't just going to fall apart and withdraw and give everything over to the Taliban after 20 plus years of sacrifices, trillions of dollars and thousands of lives. This was a planning failure on the Biden administration. And that's who needs to be held accountable here. And I can promise you that's who will be held accountable here. With that, I'd like to recognize my good friend from Texas, Mr. Moran, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of the witnesses for being here today to share your testimony. Thank you in particular, particular for putting national security policy and foreign affairs policy ahead of politics. I appreciate that. Your commitment to improving our future behavior by evaluating our past decisions is underscored by your presence here and the testimony you've given, and I deeply appreciate that. Uh, Colonel Crummer, I want to uh, start with you. You mentioned that in your testimony that the administration's timing and, quote, selective intelligence blindness were two of the three fundamental flaws that directly, directly threatened the military plan and mission execution. That was from your testimony. I'd like to know, in your opinion, what is one of the most grievous or egregious examples of, quote, selective intelligence blindness attributable, attributable to the Biden administration during the Afghan withdrawal process? There's a number to choose from. I think the key piece is when you have over 100 years of experience between those three four-star generals, and they're telling you, based on all of this experience, that we need to hold off on the withdrawal until the conditions are met. And these are the reasons why, operationally and based on the entire intelligence community telling you that this is needs to follow the conditions, um, when that was not followed and the decision was to go to this diplomatic island in Kabul, at that point, it was the biggest mistake made by the administration. They should have listened to those that had been living it, those that had had to endure the losses there. Um, and failure to do so was uh, catastrophic. And the reason why we put those conditions in such agreements is because if they're not followed, then the obligation for our activity then goes away. It's a basic principle of law in any contract. There's conditions proceeding. If those are not fulfilled, then the other party does not have to fulfill its commitment or obligations. And in this case, you're saying we just ignore the fact that they didn't fulfill their conditions proceeding. Is that true? That is correct. 
Oh, that is correct. Uh, you also said it's well, well known that between May and October is Afghanistan fighting season and the Taliban are at their strongest in the strategic plans for withdrawal that were offered to the administration. Was this a well known reality relayed to the administration? Absolutely. There's 20 years of experience, the Afghan fighting season. Everyone was aware of it. But it's, it seems like in their execution of plans, they ignored that uh, reality. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, how high would you rank timing as a means for a successful mission when considering the Taliban's season of aggression that was well known for decades? It's extremely important. Some people focus on courses of action, but I would always argue that the timing of your operation absolutely matters just as much. One more question for you, and then and then I'll, I'll move over the dais. But to the best of your knowledge, what agreements, if any, did the U.S. make with the Taliban after Kabul fell? I am not privy to that uh, answer. Does anybody at the dais uh, have an answer to that question, Colonel uh, Kalinda? Do you do you know as well? Or I do not. And Sergeant Major. I do not either. All right, uh, Colonel Kalinda, I want to I want to come to you and and thank you for uh, your testimony. You got about a minute and a half, but I, I want to give you uh, just the opportunity to to talk about anything that you've not been able to emphasize today uh, that we need to take away as a uh, a lesson from this uh, this botched withdrawal as to to what we need to do differently in the future. What lessons can we learn that we haven't discussed today? We we need to take a yes and approach to these disasters. We need to, of course, look at the immediate disaster of the of the withdrawal and evacuation also what what got us there uh, because if if we don't we're going to wind up in another war that ends up in disaster so i i offered you know three of the immediate causes of of the collapse and and these rhyme across vietnam and afghanistan i mean the first one is the afghan government never bothered to gain the buy-in of the of the afghan people as uh uh Colonel Crumrich Crumler said they, they became a predatory kleptocracy. Um, government of thieves where positions were for sale for exorbitant amounts of money. A police chief in a big province might go for as much as three million US dollars. And in exchange for that buying their position, they were able to use the position to make, make the money back through land theft, kidnapping for ransom, um, extorting our aid and development dollars, et cetera. And all these actions pushed Afghans into the arms of insurgents who were targeting and killing our soldiers. Um, a, second, uh, you know, a second major reason is uh, that, is, as uh, Colonel Kremrich said, the, the Taliban were much more innovative. We got very complacent over 20 years. Uh, believing, you know, we in the Afghan government believing that we could do the same thing over and over again and expect similar results. But when the Taliban are innovating militarily, politically, diplomatically, eventually by the summer of 2021, they had the upper hand. And sadly, many Afghans saw the Taliban as the lesser of two evils. Uh, and third and finally is we have got to create a, a some sort of doctrine that helps us build developing world militaries much more effectively. We can't afford to make them in our own image and likeness. It doesn't work. There are other models that would have made the Afghan military more sustainable, uh, able, to, able to stand on its own and not simply collapse like a house of cards. That's our fault, uh, and we should fix that. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you so much. And uh, myself and the ranking member are just agreeing uh, on the fact that you're right, we can't continue to model everything as if it's the U.S. model and then expect that to, to, to go forward. So thank you for that. That was, that was a great uh, layout. And you're right, military doctrine drives it. At uh, this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Georgia for five minutes, Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you for the witnesses. Thank you for your service. Um, as I listen to the, not just to the testimony, but the people asking the questions, a lot of us have served overseas a lot of us have a lot of um, joint service. So, yeah, right, right around here, I'm, say, I'm looking at Air Force, Navy, Marine, Army, literally right in a row. Uh, people, your brothers in arms, asking you questions, understanding that, that uh, you guys were there and you did that, and we appreciate your service and appreciate your testimony today. Um, a lot of us, when we talk about the withdrawal, for example, uh, 
when I, I remember when the withdrawal was happening, it's probably one of the worst adult experiences I've had in my life. That may sound overdramatic. <laughs> you know, I wasn't even there. But, but yet, anybody who served and, and understands the people we've lost, the friends we visited, the grave sites, uh, the time we spent away from our family, the months and years even that we spent away from our families, all of us, um, the traumatic brain injuries, the limbs lost, uh, 2,461 deaths, uh, trillions of dollars, 20 years of investment to give it back to the people who now are harboring, I think, what, 27 bases that are, are training terrorists now. That hurts, and, and it, I'm not over yet, and I don't think any of us are. And, and so when I hear people talk about, well, we just need to learn lessons, you're right, we do need to learn lessons, and that's what this is about. Um, you've already talked, Colonel, I, I really appreciate uh, you talking about some of the different things that we've made mistakes on, the timing, the manning, the location, all of the witnesses have talked about. One of the things that we haven't really um, totally addressed, in my opinion, um, was the command climate, and this goes all the way to the top. I'm an ER doctor. I'm also a military pilot, military uh, ER doctor, as a matter of fact. Both in the ER and in the cockpit, when things start going wrong, I've empowered everybody in the room to stop me. I don't like to land here. I don't feel comfortable. There's something wrong with this, the way we're approaching. There's something wrong with the way we're doing our mission. In the ER, if I'm given the wrong dr drug or given the wrong command, Anybody in the room can question me at the time. That's a command climate, which keeps me from making mistakes. The question is, as you commanders, or boots on the ground, were executing the mission as you saw it, but you were giving feedback, I assume in the same command climate, I don't feel comfortable with this, do you feel like you were empowered and had been heard and acknowledged in your concerns? I'll start with the colonels. Within the military structure and the plan, there was a lot of transparency on the options that we presented and then the directive that we and the orders that we received that we needed to execute. Um, as I had remarked earlier, there was some shock. Or there's a lot of shock. There was some cynicism because a lot of us had a really bad feeling of what was going to happen. Um, however, I will say that the military leaders, General McKenzie, um, General Milley, you know, they do what we do in the military. They followed orders. They did the best that they could with this, and we executed the best that we had the ability to do it. And there were some tough days. You know, having to watch Joe McKenzie get on TV and talk about Abby Gate was really, really difficult. And he had a serious burden to carry on his shoulders. Um, and I think what gets you through that is knowing that we're doing the best that we can in the military. We executed two, and FDR said, no, we're going to go into uh, North Africa. Um, Truman disagreed with MacArthur about, uh, about the atomic bomb. So, so it's not unusual for uh, leaders to take all that in because they have to look at a wider aperture and maybe make an unpopular decision. Um, so I'm just speaking historically. I'm not. So, one so way let's or get into that real, real quick, if I may, uh, because we're, we're running short on time. But it's interesting. You're right. And, and when we make the right decision, we're all held for it. Right. But when we make the wrong decision, the only way to learn from it is to say, I made the wrong decision. The problem is, in this case, and Sergeant, Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major, I know that you would uh, look at the board, your command, your command structure, all the way to the very top. Who's at the top of your chain of command? That's the President of the United States. Sir. President of the United States, Commander in Chief. Now, we can say when McClellan and Lincoln disagreed, we can say when Ike or anybody else disagreed, we can talk about when generals are relieved, and we can learn from those lessons. But we cannot learn from a lesson when it's an abject failure and no admission of any mistakes. We talk about learning. When, our, when, our, when, the, when my, my friends across the aisle say, we just need to learn from this, we need to stop playing politics with it, but we cannot learn if we do not admit it stakes. And that's the problem I'm talking about, the command climate. I can't learn if my patient dies on the table and nobody can tell me that I did anything wrong in the ER. I can't learn, certainly, if I crash my helicopter and anybody dies from my mistake. In this case, I feel like we crashed and learned nothing because we can't even admit the mistakes that we made from the very top. And that's my concern because if we're going to go into this, look, we even have a problem right now. We continue policy and we don't talk about this very much. 
but we're continuing to spend billions of dollars. Now, this doesn't have to do with the withdrawal directly, but this has to do with what's happening right now. The American people need to know. The Afghan fund, which has basically subsequently been transferred $3.5 in seized assets from the fund with the purpose of stabilizing the Afghan uh, central banking system. Of course, the Taliban basically takes that and uses it for whatever they want to. We're supporting a terrorist organization, essentially, in the idea that we're doing something right. This is continued failed policy because we haven't learned from our mistakes. This is what drives me crazy. We have a command climate inside of our own government that doesn't listen to our military leaders who know what they're doing, doesn't listen to Congress or anybody else because they think they know best, and they continue to screw it up. That's a bad command climate. I don't care if we're talking politics or military or anything else. And that's what we have to learn from. That's what we're here for today. And with that, I thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield. Now recognize Mr. Perry for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thanks for your service. Thanks for coming. I'm over here. Look, I, I will tell you, um, I still haven't gotten over the withdrawal from Iraq and the 4,500 plus lives lost there for what seems to be nothing and what to say to those families. Of course, Afghanistan's right up there. And, you know, I was around watching as a young man or a young boy, the Huey leaving the, uh, the top of the embassy in Hanoi. And I remember the rhetoric this time where it was not going to be like that. It was not going to be like leaving Vietnam. We weren't going to see that scene. And we didn't see that scene, right? It was a Chinook flying with the mountains in the background or a C-17 with Afghans hanging off the bottom of it and falling to their death. It is, it is unimaginable to, to people like me. And I imagine to folks like you who wore the uniform, and, you know, look, we all know the mantra. Ours is not to question why. Ours is just to do and die, and we get that, right? We all get that. We signed up for that. But at the same time, the American people demand accountability for their lost, for the blood that's lost, for their family members that are never coming back, for the equipping of the largest terrorist organization on the planet at the, you know, at the, the heel of the American taxpayer. And so we got to do our job here. We understand that you're carrying out orders and they're imperfect and you don't know what the answer is. And policymakers sometimes don't know what the answer is. We get that, right? Nobody's perfect. We all fall short of the grace of God. But when we make mistakes, we've got to learn from them so we don't continue the same failed policy. It is our job to get accountability, not just to assign blame, but so that we don't make the same dumb mistakes again because lives are precious. And nobody's going to join the service, nobody's going to join uniform service if they know that no one here gives a damn whether they live or die, right? We all love our country. We all want to do the right things. Sergeant Major, I, I, I'm just so, I, and I was at the time, and I still remain concerned about using HKIA as opposed to, as opposed to Bagram, or yeah, Bagram. Was there a pre-existing backup plan, do you know? Or was it always that plan? And, and I know that you had to collapse, but still stay operable, but you couldn't collapse to the, to the extent that you had to and stay operable. Plus, you also required to secure the embassy, which is not on the same location, knowing that you didn't have the forces available to secure both or probably either one. Was there a plan? Sir, there, there was a pre-existing uh, NEO plan. That NEO plan, uh, I, I'm not sure when it was uh, penned exactly. I want to say it was around 2012. Uh, but in that plan, the plan was to conduct a NEO out of Bagram. And, and when was it to be, was there, was it just a backup that it, there was going to be a choice of either location or was it we're going to use this one and if this one fails we're going to go to that one ha, ha, do you know what the determination what was the determining factor of which one to use because everything was set up for Bagram but nothing was set up for HKIA sir the uh, the, the plan for Bagram um, you know being it was uh, written uh, in 2012 um, we couldn't predict what was going to happen in the future. Right, the enemy always gets a vote, right? All, right. No plan survives first contact. Correct. Uh, so what the, the exact triggers were, 
uh, in that plan. It never, uh, from my recollection of that plan, it was about an 800-page document. I do not recall what the, uh, the triggers specifically were uh, to launch a NEO. Well, it just seems, look, you know, we, none of us here want a Monday morning quarterback, especially if you weren't there, even those of us who have worn the uniform. But in retrospect, well, as it was happening, all of us, I think, that have worn the uniform were scratching our heads, saying that was the hard point, that was the place where we were most prepared to make a stand and to evacuate from, that's where we were operating out of, that's where everything was located, that's where we're familiar. Why in the hell did we not do that? And, and look, there was a lot of lives lost. We don't want to focus solely on the ones that were lost in the final days when it seems like it's for nothing absolutely because every single one of them is precious. In my remaining time, Mr. Crumrick, I think you mentioned the concept of selective intelligence and the issues that it posed on the mission. What, if you know now, after the fact, what was not mentioned? What was, if you know, exactly ignored through the selective intelligence blindness? And what can we learn from that? The plan that was order to the military to execute goes back to the first objective of the withdrawal and the post withdrawal which was having that diplomatic base set in Kabul and that looked like the embassy and then about the four miles over to Hkaya. The problem with that is it ignored all of the Taliban threat which we have described here today of which had only been getting steadily more refined uh, and more dangerous over 20 years and so when you pick that plan, but you choose to not acknowledge or protect against this red storm that's coming, it just leaves you flabbergasted of how did you think this was going to go? And, and my time's expired, and there are good people that have been waiting to ask a question. I just got to follow up with one quick one based on that, because that's what everyone else sees. Why? Why did that, why did we just ignore, and, and why and who? Who made the decision to ignore, if you can pinpoint it, and, and look, I, we can't ascribe motives, but what do you pretend, or what do you suppose is the motive to ignore it? I was not in the room. I know what was recommended as the course of action, and I know what was given back to us to execute, and what was given back to us to execute was not what we recommended. So someone above the four-star level is the one who made the decision to do it. Ultimately, it resides with the president. Um, so somewhere in there would be the, uh, the person that you're trying to identify. Roger, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. We're now going to go to Mr. Crane for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to uh, join uh, the dais today. Thank you, everyone who's shown up here um, as witnesses, and I also want to thank the, especially thank the families, the Gold Star families that are here today. I want to agree with a couple of my colleagues that have spoke already on this topic, um, Congressman Mills and Congressman Waltz, who have talked about um, this argument on the other side of the aisle that's complete garbage, that this administration had no choice because they were basically just tracking with what the administration prior had been leading up to. And I also want to double tap on some of the things that they said, because clearly this administration did not continue the policies of the previous administration when it came to our border, energy, economics, and so many other things. So I want to debunk and fact check that false claim right now, because that's exactly what it is. I also want to acknowledge that this administration did not listen to the leaders on the ground, the generals that were wrecking, uh, recommending against their plan. Um, many of the witnesses have testified so far that that's one of the mi main mistakes we've made in previous wars, where people in suits back in Washington do not listen to commanders on the ground. I also want to acknowledge that we left behind $7 billion in equipment and gear 40,000 vehicles, 300,000 weapons, all comms equipment. And this is the thing that scares me the most as somebody who served in the SEAL teams, nearly all night vision equipment. And anybody who's ever done special operations in modern warfare knows how dangerous this is going to be to the next group of Americans or next group of allies that goes in there to deal 
with some unfriendly individuals. All biometric equipment, which is now being used to hunt down our allies. I cannot even believe that that, when I, when I read that report, I was like, oh my God, even for this administration, that's appalling. Now I want to point out something that bothers me severely. When John Kirby, the White House spokesman on April 6, 2023, made the quote in a press conference, all this talk of chaos, I just didn't see it. Colonel Crumrick, did you hear John Kirby say that? I did not hear him say that, but um, I wildly disagree with that statement. Colonel Col Kalinda, did you hear him say that? Did you watch that on TV? I did not see it on TV, but that sentiment makes me uh, sick to my stomach. Yep. 13 dead soldiers. Let me ask you guys something. Do the soldiers that have lost their lives and these families, these Gold Star families, especially the ones in the room today, do they deserve that this administration and our leaders take ownership of the leadership failures that led to this catastrophe? Colonel Crum, I'll start with you. The sacrifice by the Gold Star families and the loss of the 13 service members is something that um, haunts all of us. Um, you know, I had a chance to talk to them before we came in here. And I did tell them the story of General Latif and his family, who they saved, and are now living in the United States and are a success story for what happens when you bring these folks out. Um, but their loss is something that I will never accept. Thank you. That is not what I asked you, sir. I asked you if they deserve that our leaders who were in charge of this debacle take ownership. Absolutely. Of How about you, Colonel Colinda? In terms of ownership, there's both uh, accepting responsibility for decisions and also determining cause for why these disasters, right. this particular disaster happened and why they keep happening. And uh, that's where I'd like to see the accountability. Sergeant Major, do these families and these Marines and these soldiers deserve that leadership take accountability? Sir, I have a son and a daughter. If uh, something were to happen to them in this same regard, um, I would want answers, absolutely. Mr. Chairman, I've got two more questions. I'll make them quick. To the family sitting behind you that are still clearly mourning, by a nod of your head, yes or no, do you feel like this administration has taken ownership and accountability? Yes or no? I didn't think so. Neither do the American people. The last thing I want to ask you, gentlemen, is this. Colonel Crumwick, are you worried about this current chain of commands that is responsible for this disaster, are you worried about them being able to be successful in the war that we are now careening towards in Ukraine? Are you, are you worried about their ability to be successful in that war? Because we've talked a lot today about avoiding past mistakes. We've seen what they're capable of. Are you guys concerned about it? I am concerned about the administration's ability to do it. I am not concerned about the military leaders that we have because they're the finest cut of the American fabric. Thank you, sir. What about you, Colonel Colender? I'm not an expert on the Ukraine fight, so I can't give you a good answer. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. We are now going to move to Mr. Gonzalez for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mast, for, for hosting this event. Thank you, witnesses, for coming up. Uh, many of the people that have spent time in this room today is what I call part of the warrior, uh, warrior class. And the warrior class is, is built on uh, fighting and winning wars that our nations fought. Uh, part of that is honoring the fallen. And I, I want to start by mentioning all 13 names. We don't mention the 13 soldiers, sailors that were killed uh, about a year ago. So Cor Corman uh, Maxton Slovak, 22 years old, from Berlin Heights, Ohio. Staff Sergeant Darwin Hoover, 31 years old, from Sol Salt Lake City, Utah. Sergeant Johnny Picardo, 25, from Lawrence, Massachusetts. Sergeant Nicole G. 23 from Sacramento, California. Corporal Hunter Lopez, 22 from Indio, California. 
Corporal Dagan Page 23, page 23 from Omaha, Nebraska. Corporal Humberto Sanchez, 22, from Logansport, Indiana. Marine Corporal Lance, Lance Corporal uh, Espinosa from Rio Bravo, Texas. Lance Corporal Schmidt, 20, from St. Charles, Missouri. Lance Corporal McCullum, 20 years old, from Jackson, Wyoming. Lance Corporal Miliola from Rancho Cucamanda, Cucamanga, California. Lance Corporal uh, Kareem Nikui from Norco, California. Staff Sergeant Ryan Naus, 23, from Corrington, Tennessee. So we honor our dead. We honor those that have fallen for our country. We also, as leaders, make sure we don't have to read names at a hearing. And part of that is I'm concerned with, um, I'm concerned with what happened, no doubt. I spent 20 years in the military. I'm a retired Navy Master Chief. I spent five years in Iraq and Afghanistan. Like many of us in this room, Afghanistan is very personal to us. I grew up there, like a lot of us who spent time there. But I'm also a Navy, a Navy, a Navy Master Chief. I don't believe in excuses. I believe in results. And I'm focused. It's an absolute tragic tragedy what happened. We also have soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines in Syria, in Iraq, and throughout the world. We're going to continue to fight these, war, these wars. There are going to be times when we have withdrawals. It's the way the world works. So we have to learn from what happened to, to make sure that we don't read more names when we withdraw from a pick, pick a place. Part of that is you, gentlemen. Please continue to tell your story. Continue to be an advocacy in this group, uh, in, in, this, in this sphere, so that way we can prevent future incidents from occurring. It's also on us as legislators to do our part and make sure those are held, held accountable and we are prepared in every form or fashion. So I just wanted to spend my time honoring those that have fallen and also mention it is our responsibility to make sure that, that the, the next conflict, the current conflict, we don't have the same debacles that we have. The fact that we, I had to read 13 names clearly shows that there's an, is, there's an issue there. But once again, less about, less about excuses, more about results, and it's going to be the warrior class that determines that we, we fight through the politics in this all. Thank you, gentlemen, and I yield back. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. We're now going to yield to Mr. Nunn for five minutes. I appreciate that, Mr. Mass. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for the families who are here first and foremost. To those of you who were the final safeguard, the breach, if you will, that stood the line and helped evacuate as many as Americans, our allies, and our friends who had spent decades serving with us, this nation owes you a, a debt of gratitude. You know, I've flown more missions over Iraq and Afghanistan than I care to remember. But the reality is, is that whether you're the command pilot or whether you're that first-term airman who's just operating a SIGINT box on the back of a recon plane, when you land, you all do an after-action, and you're all equals. You all have the opportunity to decide what worked and what did not work. Today, you are the front line and perhaps the only that we are hearing out of the administration on what that after-action looks like for the withdrawal of Afghanistan. I don't think any of us should have to look back and think that what happened in August should ever happen to any of our sons, daughters, brothers, or combat allies ever again. When President Biden said this will be no Afghanistan, or this will be no Vietnam, this will be no helicopters lifting off buildings, he was absolutely correct. It was far worse. We had an Afghan government caught completely by surprise by the lack of information provided. We had a U.S. government that chose, as you've highlighted today, selective intelligence to share, not only with our allies, not only with our five eyes, our closest partners, but the men and women who were on the front line. Men and women like Corporal Deegan Page from my district. A young Marine, one of 13, whose family now stands as Gold Star families because he gave the ultimate sacrifice. Charged with defending Abbey Gate and deciding who got to live and who got left behind, he was provided critical intel gaps, arguably selectively, by an administration who wanted to drive a timeline based on a calendar date, not by facts on the ground. He gave his life. His family is proud. We are honored. And so many Americans live today because of his sacrifice and the sacrifice of so many other families like that. To you, we can never salute you enough. But we stand here in the breach 
so that this does not happen again. Friends, when the helicopters left Afghanistan, it saved maybe their president. But so many more Afghan allies fell off the tread tires of C-17s leaving Hkaya, something that arguably could have been avoided. And so in today's testimony, I'd like to go into detail here on how we got to a point where we abandoned Bagram Air Force Base. Colonel, I'm going to start with you. Do you believe the top Pentagon brass, such as Austin, Milley, Miller, McKinsey, could have and should have done more to push back against President Biden after he rejected their advice to leave a residual troop presence of 2,500 in Afghanistan, primarily protecting Bagram? I've thought a lot about this question, and uh, I've gone back and forth on it. They, I can speak for the military leadership they were in a very difficult position where they gave the president their best course of action recommendation and it was not chosen and they have a decision at that point do you continue to follow what the president said or do you step away um, i commend them for holding the line because we would have still done it and they were in the best position to try to do it as responsibly as we can in the very strict guardrails that were put on that course of action and they had to be the face of it, um, which I don't think was fair. But they were man enough to stand up there and look right down the barrel of the camera as things fell apart and give some responsibility for something they didn't recommend. Understood. So let me ask the next question. What would have been the impact if the United States had been able to keep Bagram and not been committed to an artificial deadline, but shared the intelligence on the ground of the real threat and been able to get more Americans, more allies, and ultimately protect Bagram Air Force Base so that we could have the evacuation that could have resulted in success rather than failure. Colonel, for you. I can only guess, because that's not what happened. But I know that we would have had more space and time to be able to try to set the conditions for our Afghan allies to get their feet set for what was coming. It wouldn't have been this immediate rip out that left them looking where did we go in the middle of the fighting season. They would have had a chance. I'm not saying the outcome would have changed. I don't know that. There's no way that I could read the tea leaves of the future if it had gone the other way. But we did, when we didn't give them a chance, then we damned them to exactly what happened. Command Sergeant Major Smith, I understand that you have delayed your deployment to CENTCOM so that you could be here today. It is both admirable and greatly appreciated. You highlighted the fact that by transitioning out of Bagram, we left a well-defended base with thousands of troops to be able to support and defend a rear guard action in the face of what was known to be an insurgent Taliban force that at any day could march on the Capitol. But instead, you and your team were part of, as you noted, just over 100 infantrymen and Marines defending an international airport under siege from all sides. In your testimony, you cited that the site selection team by U.S. State Department raised a personal comfort as a consideration of whether to use Bagram. Could you please elaborate that on that? Specifically, did State Department give the impression that they were reluctant to move embassy officials there because the space was, let's say, less comfortable? at a military base like Bagram? Sir, that's a correct indication, yes. Is it your further belief that State Department made choices that were most convenient for State Department officials rather than mission essential items, evacuating U.S. personnel, the destruction of um, classified information and um, sensitive items going forward? Sir, as I'm not privy to the uh, decision-making process that occurred at the embassy, I, I cannot fully answer that question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to just end with an appreciation for those who have served, including those who continue to serve. As so many on this committee have stood up to be able to stand in the breach with you, including our own team at Task Force Argo that evacuated over 3,000 Americans and our allies by civilian air with no help from the U.S. State Department. This after action is the only insight we have into what's happening. And while I praise you for being here, there are men far above your station that should be in this room 
justifying their actions today so they can never happen again. With that, Mr. Chair, I thank you and I see my time back. Thank you, Mr. Nunn, for your service. Thank you for your questions. I would just say right now, I see something happening that I've actually never seen here before. And it makes me proud. Uh, and it is, I have colleagues that are sitting down there with our service members and with Gold Star families, just to let them know that they're not sitting above them, they're not detached from them, but that they're with them. And they were part of the same fight and, and chewed the same dirt in a sense and, and showing that connectivity. And honestly, I've never seen it before in my time in Congress and it makes me proud to see that. I'll say that very, very truly. It makes me proud to see it. Um, we have one other, two more individuals, Mr. Van Orden, and then I have myself yet, but Mr. Van Orden, I yield you five minutes. Of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank all you guys to be here, or for being here. I appreciate it, Command Sergeant Major. Uh, rock on, dude. Take care of the boys when you get overseas, and girls. Um, I appreciate your efforts. Uh, my personal history with Afghanistan, I didn't get there until 2003 uh, for my first tour. Uh, I held one of my friend's hands as he died uh, in the old cache when it was a tent. Um, we had a satellite phone next to his ear listening to his wife uh, cry out to him and to God because she knew that she'd never see her husband alive again. Um, when this started happening, I could not sleep. My wife told me just to go back to Afghanistan, so I linked up with one of the groups you referred to in your testimony, and I wound up in Abu Dhabi in Dubai processing people that civilians extracted with the help of a foreign government because our government willfully and knowingly abandoned American citizens and our allies to terrorists. So I got a couple questions for you guys. Was there a written plan for this exfiltration? Colonel? I did not see a written plan for the exfiltration for this specific mission. Okay, I'm so sure reading, there were orders given, though. Right, reading through here, you were planning and you were building an airplane flight. Okay, we had X amount of years to figure this out. Everybody from the Biden administration says their hands were tied because of the Doha agreement, so they should have known that something was happening. And when I say the Biden administration, I mean Secretary Blinken, uh, General Austin, now SecDef, and General Milley. They are all culpable in the deaths of all of these people because they are incapable of doing their jobs. Everybody, I'm a retired Navy SEAL. Sorry, I should have thrown that out there. So I understand that NEOs are the purview of the State Department. And it, they waited so long to turn this NEO authority over to the DOD to activate it. They, they're responsible for all these people's deaths. That is a fact. Um, have any of you in your vast military experience ever heard of a plan where you would intentionally withdraw all the military forces that are protecting civilians out before you would pull the civilians out? Anybody? No. Colonel? Other Colonel, rather? The uh, Douglas MacArthur said that every military disaster can be described in two words. Too late. Very well. Command Sergeant Major? No, sir. Okay. Um, why did the Biden administration, in your opinion, Command Sergeant Major, I will not ask you this question, why, in your opinion, did the Biden administration continue to lie about the number of American citizens that they willfully abandoned to terrorists in Afghanistan? I couldn't even begin to speculate. Are you willing to accept the fact that the Biden administration kept moving the ball and lying about the amount of American citizens they abandoned to terrorists in Afghanistan knowingly and willingly? I'll say that the statements that came out from the administration did not match the facts that we were clearly seeing on the ground. Okay, Colonel. I was very troubled that I believe 90% of the evacuees were not people who had served, worked, were not Afghans who had worked for the U.S. government or the U.S. military. Getting there. I've got um, interpreters who are still on the ground that we're trying to get their SIVs, trying to get them out. Uh, and the fact that this withdrawal often was the withdrawal of the well-connected and not the people who are SIV holders, I think deserves serious examination. Very well, thank you, Colonel. Uh, how many of our NATO allies that have been fighting this fight for a long time, since 2003, when the Lithuanians were trying to get into NATO, uh, how many of our NATO allies wanted to uh, follow this timeline and get out of Afghanistan on the arbitrary timeline that the Biden administration set? How many of our NATO allies 
wanted to go on that timeline, to the best of your knowledge, Colonel? None that I know of. Colonel? I'm not privy to that. Okay, I am. The answer is zero. Nobody wanted to leave from NATO. This has been a NATO fight for a very long period of time, and you guys didn't even address this. So this would have fractured NATO. It's unbelievably irresponsible that the Biden administration would completely blow off all of our NATO allies. None of them wanted to leave. And then everybody quotes that we'd have 2,500 U.S. forces in the country. That's not enough. That's not true. There would have been 10 to 12,000 forces, a multi, uh, multi culture, excuse me, a multi, it would have been an MND again. So combined Joint Special Operations Task Force that I was with, we would have had the same thing, CJTF-180, all the guys here at 10th Mountain. It would have been the same type of thing. So they're lying. And here's the most important question I can ask anybody here. Who has been fired for this? No one. Colonel, to your knowledge? Uh, no one that I know of. Okay, so this is the most disgraceful thing that I can think of that the United States government has ever done in our entire history, and zero people have been held accountable from the Biden administration. Zero. Right? How about the military writ large? Zero. Who was the ground force commander? What's he doing now? You guys know? Do you? Do you know who it was? Yeah, Admiral Vaisley, and then it was General Donahue. I will say, in their defense, they were given an impossible situation, and they showed extraordinary leadership when every single aspect of what was going on turned into total chaos for things that were outside of their control. I get it. Um, Senator Tom Cotton, when he was questioning uh, General Milley, asked him one thing. He said, why have you not resigned yet? And General Milley said he thought it would be a profoundly political statement. I wish that my friend Tom Cotton, who I respect gratefully, did one more follow-up question. General Milley, if intentionally abandoning American citizens and our allies to terrorists, many of them to certain death, is not worth making a political statement, what in your estimation, General Milley, is? None of these people that are there and we're giving them passes, I'm not. These general officers and flag officers should have resigned on the spot, gone on television and said, this is wrong. You know what that takes? That takes courage. We have so many things wrong with our military at the senior levels and in the Biden administration, it's embarrassing. These people, I'm calling for them to resign. General Milley should not have a retirement. He should not. General Austin should be, I don't know what the heck he should be doing, but he sure as hell should not be leading our military. He's a disgrace. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you allowing me to speak my piece here, and I yield back. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Vanorden. I now recognize myself for five minutes. I've heard a lot of things today. I appreciate every bit of what I've heard. I appreciate you all offering us your candor and your honesty, and I'd ask that you bear with me for a couple more minutes of questioning. I want to talk about the SIVs, the planning, the operations as we've done in large. When I think about planning, I think about you come up with an objective that you want to meet. And after you have an objective that you want, you come up with a strategy and tactics by which you think you're going to accomplish that objective. And then you do something really important. You practice it. So you can see what goes right and what goes wrong, how things play out when the metal hits the meat, as they say. Let me start with a broad question. Uh, Colonel Crumrin, to your knowledge, what level of practice took place? This is a very general question to the whole of the, the withdrawal. To your knowledge, what level of practice took place? There was no time when the order was given to start withdrawing, when the announcement came out on the 14th of April, one May, we saw water rolling, basically being sucked down the drain from all those out stations in Afghanistan were coming back to do an extraordinarily difficult task. There was no time to be able to go through a full rehearsal. It had to happen now. So let me ask some of the specifics on this. Was it then not practiced? If a, a suicide bomber a person, a vehicle-borne IED, something else, went off at one of the, the access points? 
units have that already baked into what they do for their battle drills, for their standing operating procedures. One of the reasons the speed was so important with the withdrawal from a planning perspective was to try to limit the exposure area for our service members that would be, frankly, vulnerable during the time period of withdrawal. The reason I ask about practice for that, uh, Sergeant Major, you brought up that you were looking at the level of services that were available at Bagram versus H. Kaya. And you mentioned that the, the level of service there was maybe a level two hospital. In your opinion, did it matter that it was a level two me medical facility and not a level three medical facility? Sir, if uh, one of my soldiers were to get wounded, I would want a level three there. Um, why? For the greater life-saving ability. Let me ask some more planning and practice questions. Was it ever practiced that there would be thousands evacuated on civilian flights that pulled cash out of their wallet and flew halfway around the world to get people out of what was effectively a still a, a standing war zone, Colonel Crummer? No. Was it practice that an airfield could be overrun by a thousand people? No, not in this situation. To anybody's knowledge? Or overrun by 10,000 people? Sir, I can speak on the behalf, on the behalf of Bagram. Um, that was practiced okay. on Bagram. That, that, that was a scenario that was exercised continually. Uh, we, we and you offered analysis based on you practiced this at Bagram, but what with H. Kaya? So I don't know. I, I am not privy to, uh, to what happened at H. Kaya. I was not there. But I can say that uh, these contingencies were very well rehearsed and planned for in Bagram. How many airstrips at Bagram? How many runways? There are two main runways that you can take off from that I am aware of. Was it practice that they may be down to one runway at H. Kaya? I don't know that it was. There's a lot of these questions that we can ask about what was practiced, what was planned for, what was prepared for. And as I think about the, the hundreds of those that I can ask, largely the answer comes back to it wasn't thought about, whether it was because there wasn't given the time to think about it, or if somebody thought about it, somebody didn't want to hear about it. They wanted, maybe they wanted a plausible deniability. I won't pretend to put myself into somebody else's mind. But there was a, a willful ignorance that took place with this withdrawal. Cost the lives of service members. It looked like you had a comment on that before I finish up. I'm happy to hear you out, Mr. Crummer or Mr. Colonel. I thought I saw your heads go up. You know, it appeared to me as though there was a willful ignorance. I think the facts bear that out. And I can't say anything more than what my colleagues have already said on this. Other than that, it cost unnecessarily the lives of our service members, and it leaves those that are still serving and those that are still mourning with the question of what has changed. And I can't come away after several hours of questioning with you all and tell them this is what has changed. This is who learned the lesson and who would say, yes, I would absolutely do that differently. And that's not what I want to be left with. That's all I can say on that for now. In that, I'm going to, oh, we did have somebody else join us. Very good, Mr. Banks, I recognize you for five minutes. I thank the chairman for holding this hearing. It's so important, and to this point, no one has yet been held accountable for the disastrous, deadly, embarrassing 
withdrawal from Afghanistan. In fact, last year, General Frank McKenzie, then uh, general, retired general um, in charge of CENTCOM, said he himself had many regrets about what happened in Afghanistan. In March of this year, I asked Secretary Austin before the House Armed Services Committee, sir, do you have any regrets? General McKenzie has regrets. General Austin, Secretary of Defense for the United States of America, overseeing this withdrawal, do you have any regrets? He said, I have no regrets. And I wonder from each of you, how does that make you feel when you hear the top leader of our Pentagon, of our military, say he has no regrets about what happened in Afghanistan? Colonel, we'll start with you. Extremely frustrated and let down. You know, I lost six soldiers from my unit in Afghanistan in 2007. And the fact that there has not been a examination of why these failures, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, why these failures keep happening um, is, is very frustrating to me because it seems that the next time we get into one of these interventions, we're going to make the same basic mistakes and it's going to heighten the risk of another disaster. And that, that I find unacceptable. Sir, this is my current leadership, and I am not in a position to uh, speak on the matter of this question. Understood. Hopefully one day you'll be able to tell us what you really think. Uh, Colonel, c c respond to Secretary Austin, though. I mean, the, the arrogance to say that. I mean, the, the families behind you the, of, who lost loved ones, the heroes that we lost that, that deadly day, and other deadly days in Afghanistan, to say that you have no regrets. I mean, to me, it was to, as a veteran of the war in Afghanistan who served with others, who heroes that we lost, to say, I have no regrets. I mean, I, can, respond to that, Colonel. All combat veterans have regrets. You know, I've been very fortunate where the VA has been able to help me, and I've got a support team that helps me work through that every day. But I find that comment tone deaf and not tethered to reality. You have to have regrets. You should. It looks like September 10th, 2001 there now. It's only getting worse. There's nothing but regret and pain and struggle there. So I, I find that statement to be wildly um, painful for everyone who's had to put in blood, sweat, and tears for the families that lost their family members. I mean, it's, it's, it's got me absolutely livid. Um, I don't know what I would say to him, um, but I strongly disagree on every level. Yeah. Uh, can you unpack more about what happened um, leading up to the withdrawal? There's been a lot, a lot of discussion today about the decision to close down Bagram and rely on the very public um, airport in Kabul uh, to withdraw. But can you, can you tell us more about, uh, for someone, for, for General Austin, who led troops in Afghanistan say has no regrets. Can you talk more about that, that decision to close down Bagram that led to the deadly, the devastation that happened in Kabul? Um, how, how, could, how could he say he has no regrets when obviously those were terrible decisions that were made? I can't speak for Secretary Austin. I can explain why that happened from a planner's perspective because this idea and this concept that we would be able to run this diplomatic island in perpetuity in Kabul was something that the administration decided that's what was going to happen. And they forgot that the enemy gets a vote and that they wished away a lot of these other issues that clearly came to pass, that everybody was warning, not just the military leadership, but also the interagency and the intelligence community was just telegraphing this every day. Um, I, I find it... Um, I just, I just cannot figure out the decision making. Um, I know why they picked HKIA because it was close to the embassy, um, and they just fell in love with their plan. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time in both places, Bagram, and um, the Nor uh, North North Kaya um, throughout Kabul. It's a decision that will never make sense to me, and I hope one day we can unpack it more. I want to finish with one quick question. My time is almost expired. Representative Mills dug into this question. President Trump. Uh, led us down a path to withdraw from Afghanistan, but to keep a light footprint of special operation forces there in place. Uh, and I wonder, Colonel, if, if we would have 
adopted that plan, that course of action, would those lives likely have been saved that day? Speaking as a retired Green Bray myself, um, I have no doubt in my mind that if we had Green Berets, SEALs, Air Force Special Operations, MARSOC out, holding the picket line with our Afghan, especially the Afghan SOF that were there, we would have stood, we would have stood a much, much greater chance to build time and space to work on all the things that needed to be worked on in Kabul. Yeah, well, thank you for that answer. To the families who are here, I will spend the rest of my time in Congress fighting for accountability for those who made those ridiculous and stupid decisions that led to the loss of your loved ones. I, I promise you that. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, my friend. I'm now going to recognize Mr. Crow for five minutes for a closing statement. Thank you, Chairman, uh, and thank you to all the witnesses for coming in today. Um, there was a lot of ground covered. I appreciate uh, your, your candor and, and your testimony and your work. Uh, and again, I want to recognize the Gold Star families for being here. Um, I, I, I can't imagine how, how challenging it is to listen to this and to rehash this and to see some of those videos, uh, which, of course, we needed to see, right, the American people, and, and we all need to see that. We can't shy away from the reality, uh, but um, uh, for uh, being here today, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm going to do two things. I first want to address some issues that I, I think were incorrect, uh, but that some of my colleagues uh, made, some statements. And then the second is I want to provide some context about the timeline and, and the situation as I see it. Uh, number one, uh, a lot of comments about the President's statement uh, classifying the, the withdrawal as a success uh, and criticism of that statement. That statement, to be clear, was within the context of him applauding the work of the military. And, and our troops and our soldiers, right? And, and applauding their sacrifice and their service for, with, the, with, with the withdrawal. And that's the same type of statement that I would make, that, that they, they worked hard under extraordinarily difficult circumstances, under circumstances that uh, uh, in, they largely shouldn't have had to have addressed, but they did their job and they did it well and they did it, they, they did it remarkably, and that's what the president was talking about. Uh, second, a couple of folks have mentioned, you know, that we haven't had any testimony from uh, officials involved in the withdrawal or even active administration officials that have come before this committee, um, that's because the majority hasn't called them, right? So, uh, you know, your testimony has been great and I've appreciated it all, but uh, if the majority wants to hear from those folks, it's the majority that can call a panel of, uh, of sitting officials. So uh, I think that criticism is a non sequitur as well. Um, the second is, is, is you, can, you can disagree about the logistics and the timeline, but there's also been a number of comments that have outright said that administration and certain officials, and including lifelong uh, service members, people who have dedicated their life to this country, accuse them of lying, of, of covering things up, of obfuscating the truth. Listen, uh, there's just no indication that anyone's acting in bad faith and has lied. Now, I disagree with folks all the time. I have my disagreement with uniformed people. I have my disagreement with the administration sometimes on a variety of issues, whether it's Afghanistan or Ukraine, because I have an independent obligation as a member of Congress to, to uh, uphold my views, right? And, and I'm not just going to rubber stamp anybody. But to be clear, uh, I, I've, never, I've never for an instant thought that anyone's acting in bad faith or wanted U.S. soldiers to be killed or put into a difficult situation or lied about anything. So let's just be real about that, right? I think we owe it to folks to have disagreements and debate about um, the facts, uh, but uh, accusing people of bad faith is just not appropriate. So for my part, I, I did disagree with the, the timeline. Uh, I, I was very vocal in 2021 that the withdrawal and the evacuation should have started earlier. Uh, I, I uh, we talked about it in the media. I, I pressed folks for it. I thought that uh, as soon as the president announced in April of 2021 that we were going to abide by the Doha agreement and, and withdrawal, that that withdrawal should have happened earlier and we could have spread it out and could have done it in a more methodical way. So that's my disagreement. And that's my view. But the situation was a tough one, and I do want to provide that perspective very quickly in the time that I have. President Trump uh, engaged his representatives in the Taliban to negotiate the Doha Agreement. 
the Doha agreement was uh, agreed to, and we started our reduction of troops as a result of that. The, uh, and I want to enter into the record uh, an open statement before this committee in June of 2021 by Deputy Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation Ambassador Molly Fee, if I may. And in this statement, uh, which is in the record, I won't read the whole thing, it says very clear that there's no indication that, that the prior administration took into account uh, the Taliban's compliance with that agreement when they made the unilateral decision to withdraw troops. That, that, this, this is the ambassador who was in the room, uh, said this, no indication that was gonna happen. So we had a situation where the Taliban knew we were pulling out, that pullout had already started, we were at the lowest troop levels in years. The Taliban was advancing, taking provinces, taking capitals, had the momentum, was on the march. And in January of 2021, when President Biden came into office, they had no transition, because by the way, the prior administration actually wasn't even recognizing this administration as the lawful president, so they didn't even, tr they didn't even transition with their people on noon on January 20th, 2021. So they walked in knowing nothing, having no transition, having no briefings, no plans in place. They embarked on a two-month process to try to get their hands around the issue and figure out what was going on. Then they made the decision to abide by the agreement because we had very few troops there. Uh, we were, we, we were uh, being told, and the intelligence was showing that the Taliban was gonna start attacking us again if we didn't withdraw on time. So the decision the president had to ma make was one of two things, withdrawal, under the timeline and do it as quickly as possible or stay there and fight and fight hard and fight harder than we would have had to have fought for years. And U.S. soldiers would have been fighting and dying then too. Tough decisions. So yes, uh, things could have been done differently. I'm very clear about that. Uh, and there are lessons learned and we will make sure with the chairman and working with my colleagues that we learn these lessons and do it better but there is a broader context that was important, and it's not as simple as some folks would like you to believe it is. I yield back. I thank the ranking member for his closing statement. I recognize myself for a closing statement. We tend to go after each other from time to time, but I don't think it wanes on our recognition of each other's service. Proud to have chewed the same dirt as you. Um, I hope that you would join me in an invitation to the ultimate decision maker to sit before us uh, and answer questions about this. I would certainly offer that invitation. I do disagree. I believe that there were people literally working, I would say speaking in bad faith. And I say that as I was doing my preparation for this hearing, and this didn't just take place in this week. I've done timeline after timeline over the years, but specifically in preparation for this hearing, I have probably a dozen pages at least of the comments the remarks from the White House, from Jennifer Psaki, and I know when I layer those on top of what was actually going on at the time, what she was telling the American people in representation of President Biden was not what was taking place. Day after day, daily coming to the, to the press pool, speaking, saying something was happening or going to happen, and then it's simply not being the reality of what the ultimate decision makers knew what was really taking place. And we know, I guess we could say we have testimony that there was selective reading of the intelligence. As is always the case, intelligence comes in varying degrees of confidence. And we didn't really get into the confidence of the intelligence that was presented today. Maybe there's another day that we'll get into it. But in my personal opinion, there was not an adequate amount of planning that was done. And there was not planning that was done to take into account what was probable and what was possible. It was planning at the smallest level to take into account what was hoped for. And I've said this before, and I will say it again now as my closing remarks. I'm well aware of the fact that sometimes in war there is just bad luck. 
a bullet is an inch or two inches to the left or right, if it could have gone the other way, you don't even know that something would have happened. Uh, an RPG and a piece of fragmentation, a little piece of aluminum fragmentation, catches you, a, a person, a soldier, in the wrong place. A mortar hits too close to some place. You're too close to a vehicle born IED. All, all the possible hazards that exist in war, sometimes it is bad luck. In my assessment, what happened in the withdrawal of Afghanistan was not bad luck. It was bad planning. It was bad objectives. It was a failure to practice. And it resulted in incredibly bad results for some of our very best and for the United States of America and our allies as a whole. In that, I will conclude my closing remarks. I will thank each of you witnesses for your testimonies. Uh, I found it to be frank, forthright, and I feel as though I am better informed for having listened to you, each of you, today. So I thank you for that. I thank our Gold Star families for again, for joining us as, as all of our colleagues have thank you, thanked you and, and rightly so. You raised patriots and we've had an opportunity to speak about the pain that you've gone through. I wouldn't begin to say that I could understand it because I couldn't put myself in that place. Uh, I don't even like to see my boys or my little girls stub their toe. I couldn't imagine what you deal with day in, day out but I know I'm thankful to you for what you shared with this country, those that you love the most. And in that, I will say whatever the formal part of this tells me to say. Pursuant to committee rules, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, and extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length of limitations without objection. The committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.